I take the chance every time to pursue the purest form of liberty I can find, away from the humdrum of social population and all that it brought. Since I was 19, I could hardly bring myself to live in one place for too long. I enjoyed the breeze of the morning crashing against my face at the first crack of dawn, without the hindrance of mundane things causing me bother. I had smelled the evening as I escaped with it, blending in the snaking paths that sprawled lifelessly through roadways and scrubs. I had been drowsy while I walked, keeping my mind straight at the next stop, whichever it was that I knew I would never settle in. But nothing prepared me for what would be one of the strangest evenings ever as I made that walk through the slumbering desert paths, marching with the rucksack on my back bearing all of my possessions and my water. I had enough common sense to be wary of cars that came up along the road and were in a very jolly mood to pick up strangers. They were either too dangerous or too stupid. In any way, they could not be trusted. But I had no such fears when the large white Ford SUV slowed to a halt beside me. You lost? A woman, dirty blonde hair, blackened lips, and plump, called to me. I shook my head. It's hacking at such a time can be dangerous, you know that? I smiled back at her. I knew that. I flipped my device out of my pocket and there was scarcely any cell coverage for where I was from my provider. The engine of her vehicle revved in my ears with an assurance of company. A subtle breeze coasted across my skin as I provided her with the map of my route, yet to utter a word to her. Ah, that's where I'm headed, she said gesturing with her hands for me to get into her vehicle. I was tempted. I hated the small talk that most commuters often suspected I needed. But one glance in the distance, seeing the oncoming blanket of nightfall snatching the innocent orange sunlight into its fold was all I needed to know. I needed the trip in the vehicle. I've got some pastries to deliver in Miller's Cross, a small town from here, and I'll drop you off. She seemed to insist persuasively. I conceded and hopped into her vehicle, taking a seat by the passenger's side. She looked at me, away from the road, and flashed me a grin that I was undecided about. Perhaps it was the way that her eyes glazed when she smiled with a fulfillment which made me uneasy, or the fact that I could perceive how shallow the beam was from the way that her lips cracked, contorting upwards to reveal a set of chipped teeth. The smell in the vehicle crawled into my nostrils slowly, there was a damp funk suffocating under the aroma of her pastries, which she had slightly open as though an invitation. An unruly insect buzzed into the vehicle and offered temporary distraction to the awkward silence that I shared with the stranger. She cussed violently and swatted her hands this way and that to rid the car of the insect. God, God damn you beast, she said when the insect buzzed away. Then she heaved. <sighs> Terrible country this is. I could tell. I simpered and nodded. My name is Chris, she said with a pronounced pause for me to fill in. Chance, I replied. Huh, beautiful name. I'll be sure to remember it, she said. I thought that it was odd that she would say that to me as I barely ever met the same people twice in my hitchhiking trips. I mentioned it to her and we laughed about it for some time before she offered some of the pastries that I might want to have. I refused. She insisted with that effusive charm of hers that wore down my senses. Just one of the pastries, she said, flipping the covering over to show off the fine assortment of oven brown flour. The scent filled my nostrils and I grabbed a piece. They are delicious, she said to me, and flicked her head, suggesting I have them. My phone buzzing in my pants called my attention. I sighed in relief, knowing I had finally passed by an area with good cell reception. I brought my phone from my pocket to check for my messages when she flipped. Put that device away and eat the damn pastries, she barked. Her voice was the haunting timber of desperation. An unsettling yawn that stretched out after it had been uttered followed. I was perplexed by it. Excuse me? She began to ramble swerving the car across the road in annoyance that I had brought my phone out of my pocket. I broke a batch of sweat which trickled down the side of my face in panic as the car whipped this way and that. 
My fear was not immediately for my safety, and I did not quickly assume it was. I had hoped it was an episode that needed to pass. I said, eat the damn pastries! She barked again, her greasy face quickly turning beetroot red as she spoke in anger. Her insistence on the pastries made me wary. I had the thought to slip out of the car, jump onto the road, and find an escape, but even that would be foolish because if I was incapacitated, I would be no match for the visibly irate lady. I tried to ease myself, but I was so shaken by her display of grievance that I could not sit still. As though her yelling did not pass her message across, she slammed her hands on the dashboard furiously, ordering me to eat the pastries. When I did not, she tilted. She reached her hands to her side and fetched out a maroon-stained cudgel. Mother! She swore, swinging the weapon directly at me. The car drifted out of her control, but she was so crazed by my stubbornness that she paid no mind to it. That lucky bastard! You're not getting away from me! Realization dawned, and a thin veil of lulling dreams slipped from my eyes. I was in danger, and terror filled me with such sharp anxiety. The cudgel caught me on the forehead, and it felt as though the world around me had suddenly exploded because I suddenly fell deaf. With my senses that remained, I saw her drifting in and out of my line of vision in her gesticulation. Death filled me with dread, and knowing that this strange woman or strange behavior could do that to me made my head spin. Damn! I hollered, latching onto the swung cudgel. With all of the force that my arms could muster, I pried it from her and swung back. Three times in blind succession. Her body went limp, and I inhaled deeply. A strong fecal smell assaulted my nostrils from her loosened muscles, and I knew I could do nothing else but to escape her. I steered the vehicle off the roadway into the desert and jumped out as I found a safe spot to land on. After a moment on the ground, I recovered from the madness to find out that the vehicle had crashed into a rock in the distance. I picked myself off the ground and continued on my hitchhiking, still unable to make sense of the horrors that I had just encountered. That day, I couldn't really understand why Greg was being so fussy about the hike. If he didn't want to come along, he should have just stayed at the campsite. Why would he go camping with us just to stay at the tent the whole time, though? Isn't that the whole point of camping? Even if it was glamping, to immerse yourself in nature as much as you can? But in hindsight, perhaps we should have listened to George and stayed put. The hike started out great. It was a bright, sunny day. Birds were chirping, and Greg was still finding things to be fussy about. One minute it was bugs, the next it was weeds, and then it was some non-existent leeches. We handed him the bug spray, and it managed to shut him up a little bit, though. Layla was good with a compass. She'd been here a couple of times before with family, so we trusted her when she said we should go a little bit off track. It's the long way around. We'll eventually rejoin the actual trek, but this is a more scenic route. And she was right. We came across a clearing that overlooked the valley. Breathtaking hills rolled, covered in evergreen trees as far as your eyes could see. A river ran somewhere down there. You could almost hear it, almost feel the cold, refreshing water on your skin. Suddenly, we heard the bushes rustling behind us. None of us registered it as something malicious. I think we all must have thought it was some hiker. It's not like Layla's path was such a hidden gem. But he came straight at us, axe swinging wildly in the air. Greg managed to dodge him in the nick of time, barely escaping with his head intact. The axed man stumbled and we ran like hell, back to the direction we came from. Layla led the way. We could hear him screaming behind us. What the hell? shouted George. Just focus on getting back to the trek. People on camp will know what to do, barked Layla, and we all silently agreed. We could still hear the men yelling behind us, screaming all sorts of obscenities. This guy's super crazy, I exclaimed. You think? said George, exasperated. We kept running and running through the woods, and eventually we did find the trek. And somehow, somehow, we ran all the way back to camp. We reached the campsite's entrance and saw it was full of people. 
Families with small kids were milling about. Everything seemed so normal, but out of breath. We looked behind our shoulders, expecting the crazy man to be chasing us. But he was gone. Huh. The crowd must have scared him off, said Greg. Yeah, but we have to tell someone about it. I'll head on over to the office and warn them, Layla reasoned before she immediately stormed off. I stood there, catching my breath and looked at Greg. Tina, he said, heaving. I'm going back to the tent. I can't. And that was a good enough plan. I followed him back to the tent and found that I couldn't do anything but scroll through my phone. My nerves were all over the place, and eventually I managed to fall asleep. When I woke up, it was dark outside. I couldn't find my phone, and Layla was also nowhere to be found. But Greg was asleep beside me. I could tell he was in a bad shape, and I could tell he was hungry. Poor guy. He didn't even want to go on the hike in the first place. The least I could do was get us all some food. And maybe Layla took my phone. I wasn't too worried then. Maybe it was somewhere in the tent. Greg could just be sleeping over it. On my way to the cafeteria, I registered how empty the place was. I guess families with kids turned in early? But the cafeteria was also eerily empty. Hello? I called out. No one replied. There was no lunch lady behind the counter, and the buffet was empty. I guess I must have really overslept. Was it actually close to midnight? Or 2 a.m.? Where was Layla? Did they make her crash at the office? That's a bit weird. Nothing was making sense. I gave up. Going back to the tent sounded like the next logical move. Maybe Layla was back. She could have just been out to the toilet or something. But right before I left the cafeteria, at the corner of my eye, I saw something on a table. It was a Ouija board. Blanchette included. Huh? I chuckled to myself. That's funny. It's the ultimate campsite game, right? I'm sure they'll let me borrow this. Could be a great way to take our minds off of what happened that afternoon. As predicted, Greg was fussy about it. Layla was still not around, but, you know, I wasn't really worried about her. She's probably somewhere hooking up with some guy. Some hot dad looking for a summer fling. Wouldn't be the first time that that's happened. I managed to wrangle Greg into it, and there we were, sat in front of each other, one finger each on the planchette. Wait, what are we supposed to do? How do we start this thing? Asked Greg. I guess we just have to call upon the spirits and talk to them? Suddenly, the planchette moved. Greg's eyes went wide. Tina, Tina, tell me you're doing that, he screamed. I couldn't control my excitement. I must have been grinning ear to ear when I told Greg it wasn't me. He looked scared, but began focusing on the board as I did. It was moving from letter to letter. G. R. E. Oh hell no! Is it spelling my name? G. Greg! I shouted. That's right, that's Greg. I'm Tina. Nice to meet you. Who are we talking to? The planchette kept moving. W. H. O. Who? W. A. Was, said Greg, reading the planchette. The. Axeman, I said, finishing the sentence. The Axeman? Greg asked. From earlier today? We don't know who he was. He just came at us. Did he kill you? Is that why you want to know? The planchette began moving on its own again. This time, it spelled out. N. Oh, I read it out loud. No. I am L A Y. No, I'm Layla. You died, whispered Greg as you read the board. We sat there in silence trying to process the information. That's why the whole camp was empty and why it was so dark outside. We must have died this afternoon. The X-Men got to us after all. Somehow, Layla survived and she was the one contacting us with a Ouija board, not the other way around. Greg looked up at me with tears in his eyes. I felt the same way. 
Greg. We don't know who he was, right? No. We should tell her that and I guess let them handle it? Yes, it's the most logical thing to do next. I scoffed. We were dead and somehow living in the afterlife. Two ghosts, still trying to figure out what was the next logical thing to do. My name is Philip, and I go to a small private university in Massachusetts. I'm a country boy from Texas, and the only reason I go into this prestigious school was because of a bunch of scholarships that I really had to fight for. It had always been my dream to go to a school like this. A small, historical school that you'd see on some teen movie. I knew I was smart enough to do well, but I didn't realize how difficult the social aspect would be. Every time I met a new person, right away, they would instantly know that I was on scholarship. It was like they could tell that I didn't belong here. All the other students were super rich. Many of them were legacies, and they just saw me as some country bumpkin. It wasn't fair. I got a lot of crap from a lot of people, but the worst always came from my roommate Kevin. Maybe it was because we lived in the same tiny dorm. Maybe it was because he assumed that his roommate's loser reputation would rub off on him. Maybe he was just a jerk, but whatever the reason, he made my life miserable. He never called me by my name. He called me Phil, or Philly, or Philadelphia, which I hated. He always used my stuff without asking. And the day after I went shopping to stock up on food, he went into the refrigerator and threw out half of my new stuff because I'd gotten it at the dollar store and he didn't want it to infect the organic food that he'd already bought. With how he treated me, you'd think he'd just want to avoid me as much as possible, but that was not the case. He always invited me to the parties that he went to. At first I thought he was trying to be a good roommate, but I quickly realized that the only reason he wanted me there was so that he could look better in comparison. I was a prop to him. And depending on the people we were around, he either used me to make jokes about what a loser I was, or to make himself look like a better person for befriending someone so much lower than him. And for most of my first semester, I just put up with it. I wasn't really making a lot of friends, so I didn't go to a lot of parties without Kevin's invitation. I made the most of it, but I knew why I was there. I was there to be laughed at. That all changed, though, when Kevin invited me to a party at the Omega Beta Zeta sorority. It was my first Greek party, and I assumed that it would be epic. When I got there, though, I was surprised by how chill it was. I guess Omega Beta was known as kind of a hippie sorority. New age, free spirit, outdoorsy. And for once, I fit in more than Kevin. Everyone I met asked me questions about my childhood growing up in the desert. They were impressed that I was an Eagle Scout back in high school and that I'd volunteered as a park ranger for a couple of summers. Honestly, it felt great. It felt like my past was finally a benefit instead of the drawback. I ended up really hitting it off with Rebecca, one of the new pledges. She was seriously the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. I couldn't believe that she was interested in me. We had so much in common and we ended up leaving the sorority house to just walk around in the quad and talk. We ended up spending most of the night together, and it was magical. When I got home, Kevin was already asleep, but in the morning, he demanded to know what happened to me the night before. I told him that I really hit it off with Rebecca, and he got this insanely jealous look in his eyes. Rebecca? He asked. Rebecca Sanders? She'd never get with a loser like you! <laughs> I didn't know what to say. That was genuinely one of the meanest things anyone had ever told me. So, I just shrugged and walked into my bedroom. The next week, I went out with Rebecca twice. Once to a coffee shop, just so we can get to know each other better. And then, once to an exclusive nightclub that I'd never been able to enter before. We had so much fun. I was really starting to like her. But every time I saw my roommate, he demanded to know everything that I did with her. He was obsessed. I tried to just ignore his questions, but he wouldn't stop. 
After I got home from our third date to the on-campus museum, Kevin was waiting for me at our kitchen table. There were a few empty bottles in front of him, so I could tell he was at least a little drunk. He demanded to know what I'd been up to, so I told him. He absolutely freaked out. He jumped out of his chair and flipped the table onto its side. The bottles flew everywhere. What's your problem, man? I asked. You are. Someone like you doesn't deserve Rebecca. And I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure she realizes that. What do you mean? He winked at me. You'll see. Now, of course, I told Rebecca everything. She didn't understand it either. She barely even knew Kevin. I assured her that he was all bark, no bite, but she didn't seem convinced. Honestly, I wasn't convinced either. For the next few weeks, I kept seeing Rebecca, but I always looked around to see if Kevin was nearby. Once, I thought I saw him staring at us in the park, but when I ran over to confront him, he was already gone. Whenever I got back to the dorms, he'd always be completely silent around me. Then, one day, everything changed. He knocked on my bedroom door, a big smile on his face, and asked, So, do you and Rebecca want to join me and my girlfriend tonight? We're having a game night in the dorms, and I want you both to be here. What? I asked. Well, for one thing, I had no idea he had a girlfriend. And for another, he was acting so normal. Clearly, he was up to something. He repeated his offer again, and I said, Sure, let's do it. So that night, Rebecca and I sat in our dorm living room across from Kevin and this busty blonde named Jessica. Kevin had his arm around Jessica the whole time, but that didn't stop him from staring at Rebecca like a total creep. I asked him what games we were going to play, and he pulled out a single beer bottle. Spin the bottle. He said. No, I told him. Definitely not, Rebecca said. You better play along, he said, or I'll get you kicked out of school for attacking me. What? I never attacked you, I said. Without saying anything, Kevin got out of his chair and walked over to the wall. Then, he slammed his head against the wall, hard. Then he slammed it again. After three times, he walked back to his chair and sat. His nose was swollen, and blood streaked down his forehead. Don't you see what you just did to me? He asked. Our school has a zero tolerance policy toward violence. Then he grabbed the lock of his hair and violently ripped it out of his head. What the hell? Rebecca said. I felt the same way. But Jessica didn't react at all. She wrapped her arm around Kevin and kept staring forward. So, Kevin said, should we start the game now, or do you want to hurt me some more? Rebecca pulled out her phone. I'm calling the police, she said. That was when Jessica finally reacted. She jumped out of her chair and grabbed the phone from Rebecca. No cops, she said right in Rebecca's face. Not until I get paid and get out of here. Do you see what you made me do? Kevin screamed at me. You take the only woman I could ever love and I'm forced to hire this crap. This is all your fault. Love me? Rebecca shouted. You don't know anything about me. Does that matter? He said. He punched himself right in the eye and then turned towards Jessica. You'll be my witness, right? You'll tell everyone that he beat me up. She didn't answer. Say yes and I'll pay you more. Jessica dialed 911 on Rebecca's phone. Hello, she said. I'm not going to give you my name, but I've just witnessed an attack. Then she gave the police my name and dorm number. Then she hung up and set the phone on the table. Kevin gave her a wad of cash, and then she left. Kevin just sat there, smiling and waiting for the cops to arrive. You won't get away with this, Rebecca told him. I'm a witness, too. I'll tell them what really happened. <laughs> They're not going to believe you, he said. I'm the victim here. I'm the one with bruises. And besides, my family owns this town. He looked so sure of himself. Three minutes later, a policeman arrived. Kevin answered the door and said that he'd just been attacked by an out-of-towner. The policeman started taking down notes. But then, he looked over to Rebecca and stopped. Were you a witness? He asked. 
Yes, Daddy, she said. And I'll tell you what really happened. Kevin tried to interrupt her, but it was too late. The officer was Rebecca's father, so of course he trusted her. In the end, he took Kevin away in handcuffs. Ever since then, I've had the dorm all to myself. It's awesome. Especially because Rebecca can visit me anytime she wants. My boss Whitney just had a baby, but she refused to take any maternity leave at all. Even though she was taking care of a newborn, she still managed all our projects and led our weekly staff meetings on Zoom. Honestly, Whitney was amazing. I didn't know how she could do it, especially because I knew her husband Paul was absolutely no help whatsoever. He was younger than her and extremely immature. I'd only met him twice at different company holiday parties, but I knew that she deserved so much better than him. She worked full time and had to take care of the baby while he didn't have a job and did literally nothing around the house. And the crazy thing was, Whitney never complained about him. If I were her, I would have divorced the loser a long time ago. A few weeks ago, Whitney was leading our Friday Zoom meeting as usual. It was just me and her this time because our other staff member Derek was doing a safety inspection at our newest power plants. Things were fine at first but I could hear the baby start crying in the background. She just wouldn't stop. Whitney apologized profusely and told me to take a 10 minute break. She shut off her camera and left the room to calm the baby down. What she didn't realize was that she left her microphone on. During the break, I left my computer to fix some coffee, but I ran back when I heard a voice coming from my speaker. At first, I thought that Whitney was trying to get my attention but when I got closer to my computer, I realized that it was a man's voice. It was Paul. I figured he was talking to someone on the phone because I could only hear his side of the conversation. Obviously, he didn't realize that Whitney's microphone was still on. She's with the baby, he said. I have a couple of minutes before she gets back. Then he paused. Trust me, she doesn't suspect a thing. All I need to do is find the papers. He said something else after that, but I couldn't make out what he said because he was loudly rifling through papers right next to the computer. I knew that he was searching through Whitney's desk. I couldn't believe it. What was he trying to find? I heard a desk drawer slam shut, and then Paul said, Found it. Oh crap, she's coming back. Gotta go. I didn't hear anything else until Whitney's face popped back onto my screen and she said, Sorry about that, I'm back now. I didn't know what to do. Her husband was up to some pretty shady business that he obviously didn't want her to know about. But I couldn't say anything in case he could hear me from the other room. So I said, Whitney, can you open your chat? I need to send you something. I figured that didn't sound too suspicious. So I opened the chat and wrote down exactly what happened. I didn't make any assumptions about what Paul was trying to do. I just told her that he was talking to someone on the phone and stealing papers when she wasn't in the room. Wendy read my message and said, I see. Thanks for bringing this to my attention. Of course, I told her. I'm so sorry. She said we could finish the meeting some other time. She needed to deal with this situation right away. Then she ended the meeting. I felt terrible for her. Was Paul trying to steal from her? Was he planning to do something even worse? I wouldn't put it past him. That afternoon, I got a call from our safety manager, Derek. He sounded really panicked. He asked me if anything strange had happened during my meeting with Whitney. I wasn't sure if I should tell him. I'd worked with him for five years and I never had any reason to distrust the guy. But I knew that he was friends with Paul. They went to the same gym. I thought that if I told him what had happened, he'd tell Paul. So I said, nope, nothing strange. He didn't say anything for a long moment. Then he said, Um, I need to tell you something, but you have to promise not to tell Whitney. I can't keep secrets from our boss, Derek. I told him. Please, he said. I think something terrible happened. Just tell me, I said. He took a deep breath and explained that there was something wrong with the safety protocols at our newest power plant. He discovered a potentially cataclysmic defect with one of the machines. But when he went over all the tests, he saw that the results were fine. 
He suspected that Whitney found out about the defects and was hiding the results so that we didn't have to close down the plants. Do you know this for sure? I asked him. I'm 100% sure that the results were changed, he said, but I needed proof, so I talked with Paul. I told him to find the original test results in Whitney's desk because I knew she still had them. He was supposed to get them today and then meet with me at the power plant an hour ago. But he never showed, and I'm worried that Whitney found out. If she's capable of ignoring a problem that puts potentially thousands of people in danger, I don't know what she'd do to her husband to protect that secret. Then he started crying. I could tell that he was terrified for his friend, and probably for himself too. Whitney had always been such a good boss. She treated me with such respect. She was the businesswoman that I always wanted to be. I didn't want to believe that she'd be this ruthless, but I could tell that Derek wasn't lying. In my heart, I knew that Whitney had done something to her husband, and I had helped her. I had to make things right. I told Derek exactly what happened on that Zoom call, and he totally freaked out. I could hear him hyperventilating on the other side of the phone. What do we do? What do we do? He kept asking. There was only one thing we could do. We didn't have any evidence to show the police, so Derek and I had to go over to Whitney's house ourselves. I picked up Derek from the plant where he was waiting for me, and then we drove straight to Whitney's house. Once we got there, I didn't know what we would find. I told Derek to wait in the car, and I walked up to her front door. I knocked, and Whitney answered right away. She had her baby in her arms. She asked me why I came, and I told her that I was worried about her after our Zoom meeting. She did not seem happy that I was there. She tried to get me to leave, but I noticed that she kept glancing to the side in the direction of her kitchen. I told her that I'd leave, but I really needed to come in and use her bathroom. She didn't want to let me in at first, but when I begged her, she opened the door all the way for me to enter. I didn't go to the bathroom, of course. I walked straight toward the kitchen. She screamed at me that the bathroom was in the other direction, but I didn't stop. Once I entered the kitchen, I saw what she was hiding. Paul was duct taped to a chair with cuts across his arms and face. Both his eyes were swollen shut and he was barely conscious. Whitney walked up behind me, still holding her baby. I had to do it, she said. You wouldn't tell me who he was working with. Is it true that the power plant has a problem? I asked. Her face twisted with rage. It's you, she screamed. You're the one Paul's working with. That didn't make any sense at all. If I was the one who told Paul to find the missing documents, why would I tell her about it? Winnie gently placed her baby on the floor and then grabbed the butcher knife from the counter. It was already red with Paul's blood. Nothing is going to stop us from opening the plant. She screamed, and she dove at me. I dodged out of the way, but she grabbed me by the hair. She was going to kill me. I knew she was. That's when Derek ran into the house and screamed for her to stop. He said that he had already called the police. As soon as Whitney heard that, she dropped the knife. She looked completely broken, like a caged animal. After that, Whitney was arrested. The story was all over the news. The power plant shut down, and it looks like pretty soon, our company will be out of business. Paul's taking care of the baby now, and Derek and I are both trying to find new jobs. Still can't believe that my boss would do something like this. I've only been dating Ty for three weeks when he asked me to go camping with him. I'm a city girl and I hate nature, but he kept pressuring me until I gave in. He said that he found this perfect place in the forest and since things were going so well between us, he really wanted to take me there. We drove to the forest outside our city and parked off the road. Then Ty took me on a two hour hike to his favorite spot. I was surprised when we got there because it was just another area of forest. There wasn't even much of a clearing. I asked him if he was sure this was the right place and he said, absolutely, I've taken people here before. I thought that was a weird thing to say but I quickly forgot about it. He started pitching the tent and he asked me to go collect firewood. I didn't want to be alone in the forest, but Ty assured me that there wasn't any bears or other dangerous animals in the area. It was just him and me. I walked for a bit, but I couldn't find much usable wood. It had rained recently and everything was too wet. 
so I kept going. Eventually, I found another clearing that had a pile of dry sticks, so I started gathering them up. It was a strange pile, as if a person had gathered up the wood and then just left it there. After I had an armful, I noticed something in the ground. That pile of sticks was covering a deep hole with something at the bottom. I was lucky I didn't fall in myself. I pulled aside a bit more of the wood and gasped. There in the pit was a dead woman. No, not just a single woman. The pit was filled with bodies half sticking out of the mud. The body on top, a blonde woman wearing high heels, stared back at me with glossy eyes. Horrified, I ran back to the campsite and told Ty what I found. He wrapped me in a hug and told me everything was going to be okay. He took out his phone and called 911, but he couldn't get a signal. He told me to wait right there while he tried to get the call to connect. I waited by the tent while Ty wandered out of view. Now that I was alone, everything seemed to crash down on me. I started to hyperventilate. But then Ty came back and helped me sit down. He said that the police told him they'd get here in about 20 minutes. We should just sit tight and wait. I didn't want to wait. I wanted to get out of there. He told me that we needed to stay here and give our statements to the police. He guided me back to the tent and told me to just rest my eyes while we waited. I did as I was told, but I also stole his phone from his pocket while he took me into the tent. There was something about his expression that I didn't trust. Since I'd met him, I'd never seen him smile like that. He looked devious and I wanted to see if he actually called 911 like he said. Once he left me alone in the tent, I pulled out his phone and looked up his call history. I was right, he'd faked the phone call to the police. But why? It didn't make any sense. I wasn't sure why I thought of this, but I decided to go through his photos to see if there was something he wasn't telling me. I saw dozens of photos of the two of us from the last few weeks, smiling and happy. Then, I got down into the photos from before we met. I saw him posing with his ex Nancy, whom I met once before. One photo showed the two of them camping just like us. She was wearing high heels for some reason. Like me, clearly he'd forced her into hiking with him. She looked very unprepared for the trip. That's when the phone dropped out of my hands. Nancy was the woman in the pit. It had to be her. That meant that Ty was a killer. He took his ex-girlfriends to this part of the woods, murdered them, and dumped their bodies in the pit. And now, he was going to do the same to me. I burst out of the tent, ready to run for my life. But Ty stopped me. He had a machete in his hand. You figured it out, huh? He said, smiling. I was gonna wait till tonight, but you know, you're just too smart for your own good. Still gripping my arm, he swung the machete forward. He would have sliced right into my shoulder if I didn't twist out of the way. I need him as hard as I could, and when he let go of me, I jumped out of the tent and ran into the woods. I had no idea where I was going, but I kept running as fast as I could. It was starting to rain and the sun had already set, so I could barely see the trees around me. I didn't know I was going in the same direction as the pit until I tripped and fell directly into it. This happened so fast that I didn't even realize I'd fallen until I saw the bodies around me. They squished under me as I tried to pull myself out of the pit. It was so deep that I couldn't even reach halfway to the top. And that smell, it was the most horrible smell I'd ever experienced. It felt like I'd fallen straight into hell. I looked up and saw Ty standing at the top of the pit, looking down at me. He giggled. I'd never heard him giggle before. He still had his machete. Well, he said, I guess I don't need to kill you now. You'll just have to starve to death down there. Was there really no way out? I looked around the edges of the pit. Because of the rain, the ground was slick and muddy. He was right. There was no way that I could escape. Of course, he added. Even though you're stuck down there, you don't have to starve. After all my camping trips up here, I left you plenty of meat. He was talking about the rotting corpses. Everything was so muddy and tangled together, I couldn't tell how many bodies were down there with me. I was about to throw up, but I choked it back. As long as Ty was still there, maybe I could convince him to help me out. I knew that was insane, but it was my only hope. Why? I asked him. Why are you doing this? He didn't answer. He just shrugged and giggled. Well, I knew there was no use talking with him. Nancy's body was right under me. I guess 
she was his last victim. Without realizing what I was doing, I pulled off one of her high heel shoes and started slamming the heel into the muddy wall of the pit. What are you doing? Ty asked me. I didn't know. I didn't have a plan. All I knew was that I would not allow myself to die in this pit. I kept digging and digging into the muddy wall until the whole side of the pit collapsed. The watery ground slid down on top of me, but I dug myself out and started climbing to safety. Mud and God knows what else covered my face. I couldn't see anything, but I grabbed onto anything I could and pulled myself out of the pit. As I wiped the mud out of my face, I could hear Ty behind me. When the side of the pit collapsed, I guess he fell in after me. He was at the bottom of the pit now, surrounded by all his victims, and I could hear him scream. Thanks to the rain, I was able to wipe the gunk out of my eyes. I looked back at the pit. Surely Ty was about to climb out the same way I did and then attack again, but he didn't. I didn't see him anywhere. The hole was slowly filling up with mud and rain, and I could still see bodies, but I couldn't see Ty. It was like he had been pulled into the ground itself. That night, I was able to find my way back to the tent. I stole Ty's car and drove straight to the police station. They sent some officers to our spot in the woods. They found eight bodies, but Ty was not among them. I don't know what happened to him, and I hope it stays this way. My name is Lisa, and I'm 20 years old. I live with my mother, whose name is Carol. Unfortunately, my father Robert died of cancer when I was in my early teens. I also have a sister, Alicia, who is 37. She moved to the United Kingdom in 2017 to work here. There, she met her husband, Charles. They were very happy, and I really liked Charles. I got to visit them in the UK, even before they got married. And Alicia brought him to the States as well, so she could get to know my mother and she had the same positive opinion about him. Unfortunately, Charles died in 2020 due to some serious complications. He had high blood pressure, and that was a major issue when dealing with the disease. Obviously, my sister was completely broken, and because of the international quarantines, me and my mother weren't even able to visit her to give her some support. Since Alicia and Charles didn't have any children, being married for such a little time this meant that she was completely alone in a foreign country and forced to be in her apartment, as most people do to the lockdown. I started talking to her via Zoom call. It was the best I could do under the circumstances. Alicia, I know there's nothing I can say that can change your situation, but try to be strong. We can talk every day, you, me, and mom, I said to my sister. I know, dear. I'm very thankful for your support. It means a lot, and it helps me to find solitude. But this feeling of being trapped inside this apartment, I never realized how small it was when Charles was here. I guess it's really true what they say. Love is all that you need. But now that he is gone, it feels like the walls are closing in. Alicia replied with an anxious expression in her eyes. I couldn't blame her. Grief is always difficult to deal with, more so under those circumstances. I understand. Well, let's talk a little about simple things. You could watch a couple of movies. I could recommend you a few titles. Not today, Lisa. It was nice talking to you, but I'm going to bed, Alicia said. But it's only 18.35 p.m. over there in London. I know, but I want to lie down. We'll talk some more in a few days. Not tomorrow, though. The day after, probably, okay? Goodbye. I know. She never liked to talk on common phones, even. Take care. Alicia terminated the Zoom call. For the next couple of weeks, my sister texted me briefly, saying that she didn't feel like speaking. Eventually, as time went by, Alicia mentioned that she found a way to deal with the death of her husband. I got intrigued and texted her, asking how she was doing that. But my sister's reply was mysterious. For now, I want to keep it a secret. Let's see if it works. But I'm hopeful. I promise I will Zoom call you the next week. If it all turns out well, I will be in a better mood. That's for sure. Alicia's words were mysterious, but at least they seemed to be hopeful. I decided not to say anything to our mother though. Although my sister was locked in her apartments, for the vast majority of time, the internet is a big universe and everything was possible. The next week, my sister remained faithful to her promise and we arranged another Zoom call. I was feeling very excited and I had good reasons for it. 
but not exactly the best ones. Hello, Lisa. How are you? My sister greeted me. Hi, you look different, I said, to say the least. My sister's appearance was shockingly altered. She was wearing a black dress with some kind of rune around her neck. Her bedroom from where she was calling me was kind of dark because the lights were off, but there were several black candles lit all over the place, so I could still see my sister. I also noticed that she had shaved her hair completely. She looked like a female skinhead. Yes, I look different, and I feel different. You're probably thinking I went crazy. My long hair is now gone, and I can only imagine how scary I must look. Also, this dress, the rune of hell magic. The rune of hell magic? Alicia. Yes, I found some websites online about chaotic magic. Alicia, I learned a lot. This world in which we live in, it's just an illusion, a cage built by otherworldly beings to enslave our souls. That's why there is so much pain and suffering in the world, senseless grief, an endless fight for survival, hurting each other. But now, I'm learning about everything, and it's time for me to be free, my sister said. She looked and sounded, in fact, optimistic. But her words, I was concerned for her mental health. Alicia, I know you lost Charles, but try to stay focused. Be rational. Yes, I lost Charles, but he would die anyway, as I will. In fact, I performed some rituals and I was able to speak to Charles. His spirit came to me. We even made love, but he can't remain in the world of the living for too long. He has to go to the dimension of primordial chaos, Alicia said. Okay, I get it. You're going through a breakdown, Alicia. You imagined all that. Charles didn't come to you and you didn't make love. There's no such thing as the dimension of whatever. You're wrong. I'm telling you the truth. But I understand that you were scared. You just don't get it. But I love you, Lisa. And I want to say goodbye before I depart. It's time for me to go. To leave this earthly shell. To be with Charles forever. To our place of eternal freedom. The void where all pain dies, and I want you to witness my liberation. Maybe by doing so, you will feel my energy and believe that I'm right. Alicia, what do you mean? Alicia! I didn't want to believe my eyes when my sister pointed a gun to her own head. And with the other hand, she waved at me while she smiled. And then... I screamed and started to cry, like a child. Fortunately, at least, since the room was so darkened, I wasn't able to see the gruesome details of her violent act. And this is how my mother and I lost my sister, due to some kind of paranormal cult. At one occasion, though, Alicia appeared to me in one of my dreams. She said I shouldn't worry about her, that her spirit was free and happy with Charles, just like she said. My eyelids fluttered, the road ahead blurring beneath my tired gaze. I wrenched myself awake, gripping the steering wheel tighter. Taking long, deep breaths, I turned the radio up higher, letting the low bass bore into my brain and keep me awake. It had been a long night, driving home from a work conference, and it was already past midnight, the moon a pale sickle through the trees forming a canopy over the road. I knew I should pull over for a rest before my body collapsed in exhaustion, but somehow, stopping on one of these dark abandoned roads beside the forest didn't seem like a good idea. I hadn't seen another car pass by for at least an hour, and the road stretched on into the darkness, winding through the trees like a serpent. I clenched my jaw, forcing myself to concentrate on the road, my high beams cutting through the gloom. But it wasn't long before my eyelids began to flutter again, and I could feel my head dipping forward before I yanked it back up again. If I didn't find somewhere to pull over soon, I risked drifting straight into the trees. It wasn't too long before a light pierced the darkness ahead of me, and I switched off my high beams, feeling marginally more awake than I did before. The light was a pale yellow, filtering through the trees. It wasn't coming from a car. It was only until I turned the bend did I see the sign, half covered in a trail of branches. 
McDonald's. I'd never been so happy to see a fast food restaurant in my life. A perfect rest stop. I followed the light, which was coming from a lamppost in the middle of the restaurant's car park, and pulled into the abandoned lot. There was nobody else here, but there were lights coming from inside, so I assumed it was still open. Cutting the engine, I climbed out of the car and stretched my sore muscles. I'd been driving for a couple of hours without a break, so it was a welcome relief to breathe in the cool night air and let it wake me up. Now that I was here, I might as well grab something to eat. I hadn't eaten since the conference dinner, which was at least five hours ago, so I was getting hungry. Locking the car behind me, I headed through the doors and into McDonald's. The first thing I noticed was the silence. As the doors closed behind me, shutting out the sounds of the night, I was submerged into complete hush. There was no radio crackling over the speakers, no spitting oil from the fryers, no footsteps squeaking over the floor, just absolute silence. When I looked around, I realized that I was the only one there. The tables were empty, which made sense given the lack of cars in the parking lot. But there was nobody at the order counter either, nor in the kitchens behind. Where was everyone? The door was open and the lights on, so I assumed there must have been someone here. Hello? I called out, walking up to the order counter. Anyone here? Part of me wondered if I was dreaming, if I had fallen asleep at the wheel and this was some hyper-realistic dream. Because it felt so surreal, being here alone in this empty restaurant, it felt wrong. My calls went unanswered, and I looked around wondering what to do. Maybe I wasn't supposed to be here, but why was the door unlocked if the restaurant wasn't open? I went right up to the counter and pressed my palms against the surface, leaning forward to peer further inside the kitchen. Hello? Is anyone there? I called again, but the place was empty, silent, abandoned. With a sigh, I turned around to leave when the lights above me flickered, dousing me in temporary darkness that made my pulse race. I stopped, blinking as the lights came back on. What was that all about? Behind me, I heard the soft pad of footsteps and spun around, thinking someone had finally come to take my order. The place was still empty. Had I imagined it? I reached up and rubbed my eyes, fatigue still tugging at the back of my mind. If nobody was here, then I couldn't even get a coffee to wake me up. With a prickle of apprehension, I turned back to face the door and froze. <laughs> <laughs> with blonde pigtails tied with red ribbons, stood in front of me, swinging her arms behind her. She smiled at me, but something about the smile felt wrong. It wasn't friendly. Where had she come from? Uh, I started. Before I could ask who she was or where her parents were, she ran off, giggling. Come and find me! <laughs> her laughter filling the space around me with an uncanny clarity. What is happening here? What have I walked into? Wait, I called after her, but she had already disappeared somewhere. Was she the only other person here? It didn't make sense. What was a little girl doing out here in the middle of the night? With a sigh, I went after her. I couldn't just leave a little girl out here alone, not until I figured out what was going on. Hey, come back here, I said in frustration weaving through the tables and chairs toward the back of the restaurant, where the consumer toilets were. <laughs> I heard a low giggle behind me and turned around, expecting to see the girl, but the room was empty. Where had she gone? The lights flickered again, and in those brief seconds of darkness I felt movement directly behind me, the whisper of a breath on my neck that sent chills down the length of my spine. When the lights came back on again, I was almost too scared to turn around. Holding my breath, I did. The girl was nowhere to be seen. Instead, a little red ribbon lay on the floor by my feet, the same one that she had been wearing. Is she messing with me? Is this some kind of joke? I bent down and retrieved the ribbon from the floor, feeling it slip between my fingers like silk. More footsteps padded behind me, soft and dainty, and my pulse raced in my ears. Behind you, a female voice whispered, edged with laughter. Before I could turn around, two small hands slipped around my neck and squeezed, and all of a sudden I was gasping for air, fumbling to remove the fingers around my throat. At first I thought it was the little girl, but the figure pressed behind me felt too large, too tall. 
The grasp around my neck was too tight, too strong to belong to a child. Darkness clouded my vision, and just before I passed out, I managed to catch a glimpse of the figure behind me in the reflection of the window. It was the child, her hair tied up in pigtails, one with a red ribbon, the other without. Only, she was taller than before, with long limbs and a strange disproportionate smile. Then everything went dark, and I felt myself falling. I jolted awake, blinking rapidly. What? I was sitting in my car, parked up by the side of the road. It was still dark, and when I checked the time, it was just after 2 o'clock in the morning. How long was I asleep? I rubbed my eyes, clearing away the grogginess of my vision. What a weird dream. I knew exhaustion could do weird things to your brain, but that dream was a step too far out of my comfort zone, and I shuddered at the mere memory of it. Feeling marginally more refreshed after taking a nap, I started up the engine, checked my rear view, and pulled back out onto the road. I got home an hour later, just after 3 a.m. My wife was already asleep, so I crept into the bathroom to get changed out of my work clothes. As I was removing my coat, something fell out of my pocket, and I bent down to pick it up. My fingers froze, hovering above the ground. A red silk ribbon lay curled on the floor like a snake, and I felt my heart go ice cold. Somewhere behind me, in the room where my wife was sleeping, I heard the soft, low sound of a child laughing. Up until last May, I shared an apartment with my little sister, Gloria. She was going to college at the time and needed a place to stay. Gloria and I were only two years apart, so we got along great. She was busy with her classes and I worked a lot, but we usually made time to have dinner together and we always made time for our Friday game night. It was more than a tradition. It was part of our lives. Gloria had proposed the idea. I was reluctant at first because I didn't socialize much, but I wasn't interested in hosting a party with all of Gloria's friends. But that first night, when we played some trivia game until three in the morning, I'd completely changed my mind. I loved Friday game night and I promised Gloria that we'd keep the tradition alive as long as we lived together. Three years later, Friday game night was still going strong. Gloria complained about it sometimes, but I knew that she loved it just as much as I did. There were a few times when she tried to cancel, but the only reason she did was because she thought she was monopolizing my time. But I always assured her that it was a pleasure to have her friends over. Then, last May... Gloria told me that she was moving out after graduation. She was still staying in the city, but she wanted to move in with her boyfriend, Robbie. I was shocked. I always thought she was happy here. We had such a great situation going on, and I told her that. I told her that she needed to stay with me. We argued about it for an hour before she finally came to her senses. She agreed to keep living with me. That Friday, we had our game night as usual. It was me, Gloria, her boyfriend Robbie, and their other friends, Lisa and Dan. Even though Gloria seemed a bit on edge, I knew we were going to have a great night. The five of us sat at our living room table, as usual. It was Robbie's turn to pick the game. Last time, he picked Monopoly, which was a little boring, but this time, he said he had something really special. He placed a Ouija board on the table. It didn't even come in a box. It was just a single faded board with the normal markings. He didn't even have one of those plastic reader things. We were just going to use a shot glass. I don't know if I like this, I said, but everybody else was really insistent. They thought it was a great idea, so I was outvoted. Everyone else reached out and put their fingers on the shot glass, and I was too nervous to, though. Gloria grabbed me by the wrist and forced me to touch the glass as well. So, what's supposed to happen? Lisa asked, as she was grinning excitedly. We just need to ask a question, Gloria explained, and then the spirits will answer. Okay, Robbie said. It's my game, so I'll start. He thought for a second, then he asked. 
What will happen tonight? At first, nothing happened. And then the shot glass began to twitch and then suddenly move. It slid over to the letter D, then the letter I, and then the letter E. Die? Lisa whispered. I jumped out of my chair. I didn't like this at all. Guys, let's put the game away. We have plenty of other... No! Gloria shouted. Sit back down so we can ask another question. I never saw my sister so serious before, and I begrudgingly sat back down. And then Robbie told Dan to ask another question. Dan, who didn't say much since they had got here, asked, Who is going to die? We all touched the shot glass and waited. Slowly, it slid over to the letter J, and then A. My name is Jane, so obviously that's what the board was spelling out. I let go of the shot glass before it could continue. Nope, I said. No, 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 we are not doing this. Jane, come on, Gloria said. Just one more question. You can ask it. I should have refused, but there was something about the look on my sister's face that forced me to keep going. Well, okay, I said. Well, if I'm going to die tonight, how will it happen? The others waited for me to put my fingers back on the shot glass. When I did, the glass started to move again. B. A. L. Eventually, spelling out the word balcony. A chill ran down my spine. Was I supposed to fall off the balcony? We were six stories up, so that would definitely kill me. Gloria reached out and grabbed my hand. She was acting extremely sympathetic now, as if I had just gotten an official death sentence or something. It's okay, she said. Don't be scared. I'm not scared, I lied. But I'm definitely not going out on the balcony tonight. But you have to, Robbie said. Come on. He stood up and started walking towards the balcony. Lisa and Dan did too. Gloria tried to pull me up out of my seat so we could join them, but I pushed her hand away. This is stupid, I said. Ouija boards can't predict the future. Then there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to go out in the balcony, right? She argued. Come on. Don't you want to have a fun game night? Uh, fine, I mumbled. I still thought it was a ridiculous idea, but I followed Gloria out into the balcony anyway. Once we were all out crammed in our tiny balcony, I looked around. See, I'm still alive. I know, Gloria said. Then she suddenly nodded to her friends, as if she had given them some unspoken signal, because they all nodded back and then walked back inside the house. With Gloria and I on the balcony, they closed and locked the sliding door behind us. Gloria gave me a big hug. I can't keep living like this, Jane, she whispered into my ear. I asked her what she was talking about, and I couldn't believe her answer. She told me that she hated living with me. She said that I was holding her back, and all of her friends hated me in my stupid game night. That's not true, I said, my heart pounding in my chest. I feel like I could barely recognize my sister. Her expression was so dark. It was like she was a different person. You just won't let me go, Jane. So I have to let you go. And we decided that the best way to do that would be through your stupid game night. Behind the sliding glass, her friends were staring at us, waiting. Gloria planned to push me off the balcony, and they were all in on it. They hated me that much. Gloria dove at me. With her hands on my shoulders, she started pushing me towards the edge. My back was against the railing. Gloria kneed me in the stomach, and she tried to shove me over the edge. I would have fallen, 
if I didn't grab Gloria by her ponytail and pulled as hard as I could. I twisted out and gripped her and dove to the side. Gloria couldn't steady herself in time, and she toppled over the ledge. I heard her scream all the way down before her body splattered onto the parking lot below. I walked to the sliding door and waited for Gloria's friends to let me back in. They all stared at me in total shock, but then they opened the door. I guess the Ouija board got the name wrong, I said. Now get the hell out of my house. It's been three months since that night and two and a half months since Gloria's funeral. Needless to say, I haven't had another game night since. I had just lost my job and really needed some money. I asked my twin sister Brandy for advice, and she suggested that I start an OnlyFans account. I was shocked at the suggestion. I didn't want to be an adult star. But then she reassured me that I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do, and that there were all different types of OnlyFans accounts, not just X-rated stuff. That got me convinced. I created an account that day. I won't tell you what I did on camera, but it really wasn't that bad. I didn't have to compromise my morals, and the money started rolling in pretty fast. After a few months, I was able to dig myself out of debt. I was also working as a waitress at the time, so I figured that I was ready to close down my OnlyFans and just make money from waitressing. When I told Brandy this, she got really excited and gave me a big hug. She seemed happy that I was quitting OnlyFans, even though it was her idea in the first place. We got on my laptop and Brandy helped me close my account without deleting it, just in case I decide to reopen it later. I told her that I wasn't planning to go back to OnlyFans ever again, but she insisted. After that, things were going great. I eventually forgot about OnlyFans completely. Then about a year later, my car completely broke down. Once again, I needed money fast, so I decided to reopen my account. I got on my laptop after work and logged back into OnlyFans. At first, I thought I'd gone to the wrong website. The account had hundreds of videos, once as recently as the day before. But I looked at the name and avatar, and it was definitely my account. Someone else had been using it. I clicked on the first video and almost threw up. It was a video of Brandy smiling at the camera as she cut up a human body. I closed the video before it got too bloody. I was physically sick to my stomach, but I had to see if all these videos were like that. I clicked on another one, and this time Brandy had a guy chained up in a small room. I clicked through more of the videos, each one worse than the last. They showed my sister filming herself as she stalked people, kidnapped them, and murdered them. And at the beginning of each video, she always introduced herself using my name. Brandy and I were identical twins, and she was dressed like me in all the videos. No one would be able to tell the difference between us, not even our closest friends. I told myself that it was a joke, but the videos all looked so real. I had to talk to Brandy. I called her and asked her if she could come over. I knew I should have called the police then and there, but I had to give my sister a chance to explain herself. She arrived half an hour later. I tried to act cool, but she could tell right away that I was upset. I closed the front door behind her and her expression got very serious. You know, don't you? I didn't know how to respond. She was scaring me. You saw your OnlyFans account, didn't you? Is, is it real? I asked her. You mean the murders? Yes, you've killed four people so far. Our subscribers are going crazy. Why? I asked. And how? How are you getting away with it? I'm not, she said. You are. It's your account. You haven't been arrested yet, but one day you will. I don't know what came over me. I lunged at her and threw her to the ground. Then I started hitting her as hard as I could, over and over. I'd never fought anyone before in my life, but finding out that my twin sister betrayed me like this was all the motivation I needed. I punched her again, but she twisted out of the way and grabbed me from the side. She held me for a bit as she dug for something in her pocket. 
Then I felt her stick a needle into my arm and I blacked out. I woke up on the floor of a dark room. I was tied to the wall like the men in her videos. There was an empty bucket in the corner and a camera on a tripod that pointed right at me. On the other side of the room was a nurse's cart filled with all kinds of sharp surgical tools, scalpels, knives, and clamps. I screamed for help until my throat hurt. Brandy, dressed in my clothes, walked into the room and laughed. You don't think anyone will hear you, right? I've soundproofed everything. I looked around. I'd been to my sister's house many times, but I didn't recognize the room. I assumed I was in her basement, the one room I'd never seen. What are you going to do to me? I asked. You know the answer. You've seen my videos, she said. I'm going to kill you. I'm your cover, I said. If people see you kill me, then you won't have anyone to take the fall when you get caught. She thought for a second. Maybe I convinced her. Then she laughed and said, No one's going to see this video. This one's just for me. She grabbed a giant pair of pliers from her cart and started walking toward me. You're my sister, I muttered. Why are you doing this? She didn't answer. She got really close and started snipping the pliers in front of my face. I couldn't push her away because the ropes were holding my arms down. I twisted my body to see how tight the restraints were, and my left foot somehow got loose. I don't know how that happened. I guess the knot just wasn't tied completely. If I timed it right, I could kick her, but I doubted that it would do much damage. Then I had an idea. Brandy, I said, before you kill me, don't you want my feedback on your videos? Let me guess. You hate them? Yes, I said. But if your fans are watching for the violence, don't you think they want to see all the tools you're working with? Why don't you bring your card in front of the camera? She looked at me suspiciously, but I guess she thought that it was good advice because she wheeled the medical cart into the center of the room, right behind her. That's exactly what I wanted her to do. She crouched toward me, waving her pliers in front of my mouth. Now which tooth should I take first? She asked herself. That's when I kicked as hard as I could. I aimed for her left knee, the one that she'd messed up on a skiing trip a few years back. She stumbled backwards into the medical cart. Both her and the cart toppled onto the floor, sending her scalpels and knives sliding away. In the fall, one of her knives had sliced across her hand and wrist. Blood oozed out. Using my free foot, I scooted a fallen scalpel closer to me, and then grabbed it with my tied hands. Like in the movies, I cut into my ropes until my hands were free. Then I untied my other foot. By then, Brandy had wrapped her wounded hand in a cloth and started coming for me again. She grabbed me by the throat. But I still had that scalpel, and even though she was my sister, I stabbed her in the stomach. She screamed horribly and then fell back to the ground. I ran out of there, back into Brandy's living room. I found my cell on her coffee table and called the police. This all happened three months ago. Since then, the police have taken down the videos and created a task force to investigate all the people who subscribe to Brandy's videos. Brandy has been locked up in a mental health facility ever since. I still don't know why she did everything she did, but I refuse to visit her. I'm not ready yet. I was driving to my brother's new cabin in Eastern Oregon. I'd never been to the area before, so I kept getting lost. I was supposed to be at his place by 6 p.m., but it was already after 10 and I was still at least an hour away. I was on a one-lane highway in the middle of a thick forest. There were no other cars on the road. Then, a truck appeared behind me. I hadn't seen it in the darkness because its headlights were off, but when it was just a few feet away, the driver turned on his high beams and blared his horn. At first, I thought there was some kind of emergency, so I slowed down and started to pull to the side and let him pass. That was when he rammed the front of his truck into my car. I lost control and careened into a tree. My airbag exploded in my face. I think my nose was broken. When I was finally able to get out of the car, 
The truck was long gone and my car was completely totaled. I looked for my phone to call for help, but I couldn't find it in the wreckage. That's when the panic set in. I was alone and hurt on the other side of an empty highway in the middle of the night. I couldn't call for help, and I had no idea who that trucker was and if he'd come back. He had intentionally run me off the road, so I wouldn't be surprised if he returned to finish me off. I had to get out of there. I considered walking into the forest and hiding somewhere until the morning, but I wasn't brave enough. I decided to wait on the road and pray that someone else would drive by and find me. I had pepper spray, just in case. Less than a minute later, a small sedan drove toward me from the other direction. I thank God that it wasn't the truck. I stood in the middle of the road and waved my arms. I knew that hitchhiking was dangerous, but it was my only option. The car stopped and I could see that a little old lady was driving. She smiled at me pleasantly and asked if I'd swerved off the road because of a deer. I told her about the truck and she literally got out of her car and gave me a big motherly hug. She said everything was going to be alright. She could drive me to a hospital about 30 miles away. I got in her car and instantly felt myself relax. My nose was throbbing and I think one of my wrists was broken, but I knew that I was safe. The lady and I talked for a bit. She said she and her son had lived in the area for years, and the road we were on had a reputation for being dangerous. Eventually, she turned onto an unmarked dirt road that seemed to head straight into the forest. She said that it was a shortcut to the hospital. I was too distracted to realize how strange that was. Why would a hospital be on an unmarked dirt road? We drove for a bit, and then she parked in front of a rundown trailer in the middle of nowhere looked abandoned. Where are we? I asked. Home, she said. Then she giggled. I panicked and ran out of the car. I had no idea where I was going. I just had to get away from her. I raced past the trailer and into the dark forest, crouching behind a tree. I could see the old woman get out of her car and casually walk towards the trailer. That's when I noticed that the truck that ran me over was parked just behind the trailer. A young man, obviously her son, got out of the trailer and asked the woman if she found anything. The woman said, Just a girl, but she's still alive. Do you want to go find her, or should we wait for one of the traps to get her? Traps? I looked around me in the dark, and sure enough, I saw a bear trap sitting just a few feet away. If I had kept walking, I would have stepped right on it. From what I could tell, this guy and his mom were working together to capture and probably murder people on the highway. He'd run them down and she'd drive by and pick up the bodies. They were insane. Let's see what she does tonight, the man said. In the morning, I'll go out and check the traps. They both laughed and then went inside the trailer. I had no idea what to do. I was too weak to fight them. I couldn't go anywhere in the forest because I'd step into some bear trap or spiked pit. I didn't have my phone. I thought about stealing the woman's car, but I had no idea how to hotwire anything and I doubted that she left the keys inside. I reached into my pocket for my pepper spray, but even that was gone. I guess it had fallen out of my pocket. The only weapon I had was this bear trap. I swallowed my fear and leaned closer to the bear trap. It was chained to a peg that had been planted into the dirt. Very carefully, I pulled out the peg, then grabbed the trap by the handles on either side. Slowly, I carried it back towards the trailer. I couldn't make any noise, and I definitely couldn't do anything to trigger the trap. Somehow, I made it all the way to the front porch and set the trap in front of the door. Then I stepped back. Okay, I shouted. I give up. You can have me. Instantly, the door opened, and the man walked out with a big smile on his face. He was holding a butcher knife. I held up both my arms. Please don't hurt me, I mumbled. I wanted to look as helpless as possible so that he'd be focused on me. I didn't want him to notice the bear trap. With a loud clang, the metal snapped shut on the man's foot. He screamed in pain and dropped the knife. I was able to grab it just as his mother ran out of the trailer with a shotgun. She shot at me and missed. 
That gave me enough time to run past her son and slam the butcher knife into her shoulder. She collapsed onto the porch, right next to her son. I kicked the shotgun out of the way and demanded them to give me their car keys. The woman moaned in pain as she dug into her pocket and pulled out the keys to her car. Without looking back, I stole her car and drove away. About 30 minutes later, I'd made it into town. I found the hospital and told them to contact the police. My brother ended up meeting me at the hospital. He was a big support as the doctors gave me a cast for my wrist. The next day, we found out that the mother and son had left their trailer before the cops arrived. All they found were bloodstains on the front porch. I know they're still out there. They probably moved on to another isolated road where they can continue their sick games. All my life, I swore to myself that I would never hitchhike. I'd seen enough horror movies to know that that was a very bad idea. Besides, I grew up in Riverside, and I'd literally never seen anyone hitchhike in real life before. Then last spring, I was visiting my cousins in Central Oregon, and I found myself stranded on the side of the road. It was rainy and cold. I was driving back from my cousin's house when my car blew a tire. I'd gotten flat tires before, but I never learned how to change one. I'd always just call AAA and wait for someone to come by and help me. But this time, I was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by trees and mountains, and I couldn't get a signal on my phone. I also didn't have a spare. Aside from a gas station that I'd passed an hour ago, there weren't any buildings around, just one long stretch of highway through the trees. With no signal and no place to walk to, I went to the side of the road and held out my thumb. I waited for 10 minutes before a car came, but it didn't stop. I was angry, but I also knew that if I were that driver, I'd probably do the same thing. Five minutes later, an old truck came driving by, and it actually stopped. Unlike the first car, which was a new little Nissan, this truck really gave me the creeps. It was rusted and missing a window. The back was filled with piles of old wood. I didn't want to catch riding that thing but I didn't really have any other choice. I approached the window and saw that the driver was about as unappealing as his truck. He was wearing a dirty white shirt. Need a ride, ma'am? He asked. My name's Brian. I was about to lie and say that I was waiting for someone, but he'd already seen me with my thumb in the air. Yes, I said. I took a deep breath and got in his truck. I didn't tell him my name. He started the engine and drove. I'm guessing you need a mechanic, he said. Uh, just a place with a phone, I told him. Whatever's close. He told me about a gas station that was about 15 minutes ahead. He promised to drop me off, and he even offered to wait with me if I wanted him to. Despite his appearance, the man acted very nice. Too nice. I didn't trust him. But there was nothing I could do about it now. I was already in his truck. He tried to small talk with me for a bit, going on and on about how lonely it gets on the road. I didn't hear a lot of what he said. I was busy looking at the pile of fast food wrappers at my feet. His truck was insanely dirty. Then I saw a bit of pink sticking out of the piles of trash. I used my foot to push stuff out of the way, and I found a woman's purse sitting on the floor. Are you married? I asked him. Very single, he said with a wink. I started to panic. I knew he was lying to me. What was his deal? I imagine that he picked up single women, killed them, and then kept their purses for trophies. There could have been another explanation, but that was the only one I could think of. I knew I shouldn't do anything to get him mad, but I had to ask. If you're single, whose purse is this? Brian laughed nervously. Okay, you caught me there. Then he reached towards his glove compartment to grab something. I was terrified. I assumed he had a gun in there, or a knife. Before he could open the compartment, I screamed, Stop! Let me out of here! He grabbed the wheel with both hands and angrily swerved to the side of the road. What the hell, lady? He grumbled. I opened the door and jumped out. Before I could close the door, he reached into the glove compartment and pulled out what he was looking for. His wedding ring. I was just gonna show you this, he said. You don't have to be such a bitch. 
He closed the door for me and sped off. I felt like an idiot for overreacting. And now I was worse off than ever. I was still stranded on the side of the road, but now I wasn't even close to my car. I didn't know whether I should walk back in that direction or to keep heading toward the gas station. In the end, I decided to keep going forward. It didn't take long for another car to stop. This one was a Chevy sedan, much nicer than Brian's truck. It parked next to me and the window rolled down. The driver was one of the most handsome men I'd ever seen. He was dressed like a businessman and he seemed instantly trustworthy. I asked him if he could drop me off at the gas station up ahead and he told me to hop in. Without any hesitation, I got in and we drove off. The man said his name was Cody. I told him my name too. We talked for a while. He told me about his work as a surgeon. Unlike my time in the truck, I felt absolutely safe with this new guy. In fact, I thought about asking for his number after he dropped me off. He was handsome, successful, probably rich. After a while, I noticed the gas station up ahead. I almost didn't want to get out because I was really liking this guy. But when we reached the gas station, he didn't stop. In fact, he sped up. I told him that we passed it and his crooked grin disappeared. His expression got really dark. When I told you I was a surgeon, he said, I guess you thought I did it professionally. It's actually more of a hobby. With one hand on the wheel, he reached his other hand into his pocket and pulled out a scalpel. You're going to cut you, he said. The car was going ridiculously fast now. The trees blurred by. I couldn't jump out, so I had to think of a way to reason with him. Please, I said. D don't hurt me. With his eyes still focused on the road, he slashed me across the arm with a scalpel, just to show that he meant business. I grabbed my arm, but that did nothing to stop the blood. Then two headlights appeared behind us. They were high beams glaring into the back window. They got closer and closer. Someone was behind us, tailgating us. This guy is a psychopath, Cody said. I scoffed under my breath. Takes one to no one, I muttered. The headlights got closer. They got so close that the front of the vehicle rammed against the back of our car. Cody lost control of the steering wheel and swerved to the side. We almost drove straight into a tree until he slammed on the brakes. Behind us, a truck parked and its driver got out. I saw through the window that it was Brian. He had run us off the road. Despite how I'd treated him before, he just saved my life. But I wasn't out of the woods yet. I was still trapped in this car with Cody. He was still holding the scalpel. Angrily, Cody shoved the scalpel into his pocket. Brian stepped up to his window and asked Cody what the problem was. You ran me off the side of the road, Cody said. That's the problem. So you were minding your own business, Brian said. Then he looked at me. Is that right, ma'am? I glanced at Cody, afraid that he'd hurt me if I said anything about him. Cody just smiled at me. And then in a burst of motion, he pushed open his door, slamming it against Brian. Brian fell backwards, and Cody tried to make a run for it. Brian grabbed him by the leg and pulled him onto the ground next to him. The two men started punching and kicking each other, but that didn't last long. Sirens filled the air and two police cars arrived. The cops ran out and grabbed Cody. Honestly, they were sort of doing him a favor, because Brian had already given him a black eye and what looked like a broken nose. As the police took Cody away, the trucker picked himself up and walked toward me. He didn't have a bruise on him. Are you okay? He asked. I nodded. I recognize this car from the news, Brian explained. It's been connected with a string of murdered women along this highway. When I saw it speeding past the gas station, I knew there was a problem, and somehow, I knew you were in trouble. I thanked Brian at least a hundred times. Without him, I would have died. Since this happened, Cody was sent to jail. He pled guilty to four murders, but I'm pretty sure there were more. I got my tire fixed and headed back home. I never saw Brian the trucker again, but I'll always remember him. Looking around at my new apartment, I felt proud of myself. I had worked hard for this, and seeing the fruits of my labor was satisfying. My best friend Anissa 
looked around the partially furnished living room and clasped her hands together. You know what this apartment desperately needs? A coffee table, Anissa exclaimed, and I nodded in agreement. I was nearly done furnishing, but a coffee table was exactly what I needed to complete the look of the living room. I was lucky enough to find couches already in the house, and I came with my bed, wardrobe, and even a study desk. A coffee table was something I wanted to indulge in. So the very next morning, I got ready and left for the Ikea store in town. I walked in, and a sales girl helped me find the right coffee table for me. It was neatly cut, round, and had a perfect finish. The day was going extremely well, but there was something, or should I say someone. The entire time I was shopping for furniture, I felt eyes following me. I decided it was probably nothing, and I didn't think too much about it. But I could not shake it off, and when I finally turned around, I saw a man staring at me. He instantly looked away, ducking his head. Intrigued, I took him in. He looked like he worked at Ikea based off of his work uniform. He had thick, dark hair that fell around his face, and he seemed to be shy. Too bad, because if he had approached me, maybe I would have said yes to going out. Okay, Vanessa, just because this guy is staring at you doesn't mean he's interested, I muttered to myself before walking away, not giving him another glance. I brought the one table back to my new apartment, and I loved how it looked. I moved over to the table, feeling the smooth finish of the furniture. I was happy about my new purchase, and I couldn't wait to buy a vase to decorate it. As I admired my new table, I noticed something. A sticky note was hanging from under the table, and I curiously plucked it out to see what it was. A phone number was hastily written on it, along with the name Steve. I stared at the paper amused, as I wondered who Steve was. I had a feeling it was the guy at the Ikea store. The same guy who was staring at me. I had no idea how he had managed to stick the note on without anyone noticing, but it was kind of funny and sweet how shy he was. Since I had nothing to do during the weekend, I called him. Is this Steve? I asked once he answered the call. Yeah. His voice was weirdly nice. Hi, this is Vanessa. You left your phone number on my table and I guess you wanted me to call you? I said. The conversation went so well that we met the very next day at a coffee shop. I wanted somewhere that was a bit public, especially since I had no idea who I was meeting. Although we spoke a little on the phone, I knew very little about him. When I walked into the coffee shop, I spotted his mop of dark hair, and I knew it was the same guy that was staring at me at Ikea. I walked up to him and smiled. He smiled back. And I couldn't help but notice his crooked teeth and the hot breath of someone who had smoked an entire pack of cigarettes. I hated the smell of cigarettes. It made my stomach turn. Throughout our meeting, Steve learned so much from me that, despite my telling him to back away, I didn't like it. I was trying to be nice by not telling him that he stinks, but he did. Why did I think meeting him was going to be a good idea? He wasn't my type but he looked up at me with so much adoration that it felt mean to say no to him. But I did it anyway. Look, Steve, I said with a sigh. I'm sure you're a nice guy, but I'm really not interested right now. Steve looked devastated. I couldn't bring myself to care. What I didn't know was that he was a creep. For the next few days, I would see him nearly everywhere. He was outside my apartment once. I always saw him at the coffee shop, so I had to stop going there. Once he walked into my place of work, and I nearly screamed at him to leave. I worked at a five-star restaurant. I couldn't possibly imagine someone like Steve going there, yet he soon became a regular. It became too much. I was thinking of getting a restraining order, but Anissa said I couldn't do that if he seemed harmless, and the police wouldn't be bothered with my case. One night after my shift, Steve suddenly appeared before me as I was walking to my apartment. I was startled and nearly fell on my face. It wasn't funny. What do you want from me? I asked angrily. He smiled sheepishly and said, I want you, Vanessa, to love me. Please? His breath was terrible, a mixture of nicotine and beer. I couldn't stand him, and I felt threatened by him. It was a reflex. I raised my hand and slapped him across the face. He was surprised, and so was I, because I never resorted to physical violence. But I was too done with him to care. 
never approach me again, I warned before walking away. I never heard from Steve again, and it made me wonder why I hadn't resorted to slapping him a long time ago. I didn't feel like I was being followed anymore, and I could finally breathe without the smell of cigarettes and alcohol following me around. I thought Steve had moved on, and I never heard anything about him until one day I got a call from a lawyer saying that I had inherited a large amount of money from somebody who left it all for me. I didn't understand. I knew nobody who would do such a thing as my parents were already dead, and the last time I checked, Anissa was alive. Plus, she didn't have that large of an amount of money. I asked the lawyer who it was, and he answered, Haven't you heard? Steve Davidson passed away, and he left all his fortune to you according to his will. He committed suicide, hanged himself, and the thing he left as his final note was his will and a piece of paper with your name repeatedly scribbled on it with broken hearts. I felt sick. I wanted to vomit my lunch. I couldn't help but feel the creepy sensation that I was the cause of his death. I drove him towards it. I felt sickened by the thought and surprised to hear that he left me millions of dollars in money and property. The thought that I could have avoided his death never left me, even after I sought therapy. And although I agreed to inherit every single penny he left me, I always felt a little guilty for spending it. Steve's death forever altered my brain chemistry in life. I embraced Steve's money, dark-haired men, cigarettes, and alcohol with all my heart. My name is Leo, and last summer, I had the single scariest experience of my life. I had just finished my first year as a high school teacher, and I was so excited for the summer. The school year had been really rough for me. I had gotten a job at a public school in Riverside, California, and I could not handle those kids. It was a nightmare. I guess they could sense that I was new to teaching, and they really took advantage of it. I know that I should have been stricter and more assertive in front of my students, but it was really hard. Anyway, I survived the school year and got my contract renewed, so now all I had to do was spend my summer relaxing and get my mental health back in order. I decided to rent a cabin in the woods just to get away from it all. I wanted to reconnect with nature, so I picked this gorgeous cabin rental in Sedona. My first week there, I felt like I was in heaven. I had a kitchen stocked up with food and a laptop in case I wanted to check the internet or watch movies, but otherwise, it was just a rustic old cabin and a gorgeous view of the mountains. In the morning, I would go out onto the patio and drink my coffee, and in the evening, I'd hike to the top of the nearest mountain and watch the sunset. I know a lot of you might think that this sounds boring, but after the year I had, there was nothing better than the peace and quiet of being alone. At the end of my first week, I drove into a nearby town to buy more food. I went to the market and picked up everything I needed, but as I was going through the aisles, I noticed a man staring at me. I assumed he was a local who was trying to figure out who I was or where I came from, so I smiled at him and waved. He just stared. As I kept shopping, this man kept following me around the store. I was getting pretty freaked out. I rushed to the cashier and bought everything as quickly as I could, and then I hurried out of there. But when I walked to my car, I realized the man was standing there, waiting for me. He had his arms crossed, and he glared at me like I'd done something horrible to him. Can, can I help you, sir? I asked. He leaned really close, as if he was going to smell me, and he asked, is that your hat? I realized I was wearing one of those dorky brown safari hats. I didn't bring any hats with me and it had been a pretty sunny day so when I left the cabin, I just borrowed one of the hats that was sitting in the closet. I would never buy a hat like this for myself. Um, it's from my cabin, I said. You're staying on the Waterford property? He asked. That was the name of the place. But how did he know? Was it just because he recognized my hat from the owner? I didn't answer him, of course, because 
I did not want this guy to know where I was at, but I guess he already did know. I very quickly got in my car and drove off. I tried not to think about the man again. It was a creepy interaction, but it happened so fast. I told myself that it was nothing, but then that evening, I was reading a book on the porch when I heard someone walking through the bushes next to the cabin. I knew there were a lot of animals in the area, but I had a very dark feeling that I was in danger. Was it the old man? Had he come back? What did he even want? I leaned over the railing to try to see who was walking in the bushes, but I couldn't see anyone. I told myself that I was just imagining things and walked back inside. As soon as I closed the front door behind me, I realized that I wasn't alone. Somehow, in the time that it had taken me to look into the bushes, that man had walked around the cabin and snuck in without me realizing. Now, he was standing in the center of my living room, staring at me as if he was going to murder me. What are, you, what are you doing here? I asked. I don't need to answer you, he said. This is my house. I knew that wasn't true. I rented this place from a travel agency. I even talked with the owner of the phone before I came here. She was a young woman named Cynthia, and definitely not this guy. The man was swaying back and forth. I couldn't tell if he was drunk or just crazy. He kept one hand close to his pocket, and I could tell from the shape and the fabric that he was probably holding a knife in there. Just leave, I said. This isn't your house. He started walking closer. Do you know my name? He said. It's Kenneth Waterford. The government took this house from me, but that doesn't mean I'm just gonna give it up. My family has lived here for generations, and you're just a city boy passing through. I didn't know what to say. Obviously, I couldn't reason with this guy, but also I wasn't going to leave. I paid a lot for this rental. Slowly, I reached into my pocket and grabbed out my phone, but that's when the man dove at me with his knife. He moved so fast that I could barely see him coming. One second, he was standing in the middle of the room, and the next, he was literally on top of me, grabbing my shirt and waving the knife over my face. I was terrified. I knew that I had to give up and tell him that he won. I knew that was the wise thing to do, but as I opened my mouth to surrender, the words wouldn't come out. I don't know what came over me. I guess in the moment of near death, I'd finally gotten my confidence. I said, Screw you, you homeless prick. And I shoved him off of me. As he fell to the side, the blade of his knife slashed against my cheek. Blood dripped out of my cut, but I wouldn't let that stop me. I jumped to my feet while he was still on the ground, and I kicked him hard in the side. He still kept moving, so I kicked him once again. Then, I called the police. After the man was arrested, the rest of my summer went by wonderfully. I got the rest I needed and caught up on my reading and I felt very, very relaxed. When the new school year rolled around, I walked into the classroom with a fresh scar on my cheek. Thanks to that summer, I carried myself with a lot more confidence. I don't know if it was because of the scar or just how I handled myself, but my students didn't give me any trouble. They knew that I wouldn't put up with anything ever again. After a year of dating, my boyfriend Trent started to nag me about my weight. He said I'd let myself go once we started our relationship. I didn't think I was fat at all, but he just wouldn't stop talking about it. Eventually, he convinced me to join a gym and try one of those high-protein diets. After three months, I'd lost 15 pounds and was even skinnier than when we'd met. To celebrate the weight loss milestone, Trent said he'd take me to any restaurant I wanted. I was off my diet for the weekend. I know it sounds stupid, but the only place that I really wanted to eat at was McDonald's. For about a month, 
I'd had a craving for a big juicy burger. I told this to Trent and he looked at me like I'd gone insane. He said that we could go to any restaurant I wanted. Money was not a problem. But I told him that the only place I wanted to go was McDonald's. So he agreed. We got there just around nightfall and as soon as I entered the restaurant, I could feel my mouth start to water. The delicious greasy smell was really getting to me. I got up to the counter and ordered a Big Mac combo. Trent said he wasn't hungry, but I convinced him to get a combo too. He paid, and then we took one of the tables in the back. We sat together, and I asked Trent how his job hunting was going. He'd been out of work for a couple months, and I earned enough for both of us, so we weren't in any financial trouble. But I could still tell that he was self-conscious. He wanted to work. He told me that he'd scheduled a few interviews, and we'd see how things would go. I told him that it was only a matter of time before he found a company that would appreciate his skills. I meant it as a compliment, but I guess he thought that I was being sarcastic. He thought that I was making fun of him for being out of work or something. He said, Well, if I didn't spend so much time helping a fatty like you get back into shape, then I would probably have found a new job by now. You're a lot of work, you know that? He was being hurtful, but I didn't get mad at him. I knew he meant well. Besides, I think he realized that he was out of line because he apologized and said he didn't mean it. I know, I told him. I know you love me. Right afterward, I went and picked up our order. We sat there in silence and I tasted probably the most delicious burger I'd ever had in my life. I mean, it was just a McDonald's burger, but it had been so long since I'd eaten something with any flavor in it. My taste buds were going wild. I was enjoying my meal so much that I didn't even notice when the restaurant's doors burst open. A short, very muscular man wearing a ski mask charged in. He had a gun in one hand. When he started shouting at the cashier to hand over all the money, that's when I noticed him. The restaurant was being robbed. I turned towards Trent, but he was already hiding under the table. I joined him. The robber took all of the restaurant's money and shoved it into a bag. Get out of here, he told the worker, and she left out the back door. Now, it was just me and Trent, alone with a gunman. The man looked around the room and instantly started walking toward our table. I was crouched on the ground, so all I could see were his dirty shoes. He was getting closer. Stand up, the man ordered. Trent and I stood up with our hands in the air. The man looked at Trent mockingly. Big spender, huh? Treating your girlfriend to a fine establishment like McDonald's? It was her choice, he muttered. Good the man said. Then I guess it's your turn to make a choice, buddy. I'm going to let one of you go, and the other, I'm going to shoot in the kneecap, just because I want to. So make your choice. Only one of you can walk out of here. I choose, Trent said. I choose me. Then he ran out of the restaurant. The gunman turned toward me. I could see him smiling under his ski mask. Some boyfriend you have, he said. But don't worry, I'll give you a choice too. You can choose which kneecap. I'd never been more scared or angry in my life. Trent had abandoned me here with some psychopath. What kind of boyfriend was he? For the first time in all our time together, I could finally admit to myself that Trent was a loser. Right, I said, and gave him a right hook. My fist collided with his face and he fell backwards. The gun dropped out of his hand. I kicked it out of the way and crouched over the man's body. I punched him hard in the face. I've spent three months starving myself and exercising every single day. I've taken boxing and Krav Maga classes until I could barely stand. Now all I want is to enjoy my freaking burger. By then, the man was unconscious. I left him there and went back to my table. I ate the rest of my burger in three minutes. It was so delicious. When the cops arrived, they took my statement and arrested the man. When they finally let me go, I went outside to find Trent waiting for me. I'm so sorry, babe. I left you there, he said. I promise never to do anything like that again. You're right. You won't. And I left. I walked all the way home. I threw all his stuff onto the front yard and told him to stay away from me. He tried to call me a lot after that, but I never answered. And I never saw him again, except on YouTube. I guess someone had gotten their hands on the McDonald's security footage showing Trent abandoned me right before I single-handedly knocked out a criminal. That footage went viral. Trent and I both became famous for very different reasons. And now, 
the world knows that I'm pretty badass. My name is Brittany. I'm a senior in high school with plans to go to Northwestern next year. I want to major in some kind of science, probably biology. I'm a really analytical person, so I've always been more interested in facts. Whereas my two best friends Tanya and Jamie are a lot more artistic than me. Don't get me wrong, the three of us get along really well. We've been best friends since kindergarten, but our interests are very different. Last month, Tanya and Jamie came over to my place to have a sleepover. And guess what Tanya brought? A Ouija board. I told her that I had no interest in that paranormal pseudoscience nonsense, but Tanya was insistent. Jamie didn't say anything at all. Eventually, I gave in. It was a rainy night, which made the whole thing even creepier. Of course, I refused to believe in spirits and magic, but it didn't help that thunder rumbled through my house every 20 seconds. My brain told me that this whole thing was stupid, but my heart still kept pounding in my chest. The three of us sat at my coffee table. Tanya set up the board, which I guess she bought used from Goodwill. We didn't even have one of those triangle things to ask our questions. Instead, we just used a shot glass. Tanya told us to put our fingertips on the shot glass. Jamie really fought against it. She keeps saying that we were inviting bad spirits into the house. Nothing good would come of this. She was being very dramatic. But the three of us were best friends. All Tanya had to do was nudge Jamie in the side and give her a look. Jamie sighed and touched the shot glass. Well, Tanya turned to Jamie. Since you're so spooked by it, why don't you ask the first question? Jamie shook her head. I had a feeling she was worried that the board would magically reveal some deep, dark secret she had. I knew she was seeing a new guy because she'd recently started canceling on us a lot. That had to be her secret. So to ruffle her feathers a bit, I asked, who is Jamie thinking about right now? The shot glass moved under our fingers. I looked to my friends to see if either of them was pushing it, but they looked surprised as I was. Slowly, we started to spell a word. D-A-V-E. Dave? I asked. Tanya's boyfriend? Jamie jumped up, horrified, and then ran out of the room. We called after her, but she locked herself in the bathroom. Then, after five minutes, she came back and explained what happened. Tanya, I'm so sorry, she said. Dave and I had sex. It was a big mistake, and I've been trying to figure out how to tell you. Tanya looked furious for a second, then instantly started smiling. That's it? I know that Dave sleeps around. We both do. We have an open relationship. Then they hugged each other, and everything seemed okay between them. Even though Jamie was relieved, she refused to have that Ouija board in the house anymore. Tanya tried to stop her, but she grabbed the board, used the stove to set it on fire, and then chucked it out the window. After that, we all went to bed. It was a strange night, but I wasn't scared. Not until morning. I woke up early and saw that neither of my friends were in their beds. I went downstairs and looked around. No one was there, but the burnt Ouija board was sitting on the table, as if it was waiting for me. I don't know what came over me, but I sat next to the board and touched the shot of glass. I asked where my friends were. I started pushing on the glass and slowly it spelled out, Look out! Right away, I knew where they were. Lookout Hill was about 10 minutes away from my house. We'd hiked there a bunch of times before. I ran out the door. Even though I was still wearing pajamas, I raced through the forest, up the path, and onto Lookout Hill. Jamie wasn't there. Jamie! I shouted. My voice echoed into the valley below. There was silence at first, and then I heard Jamie's weak, quiet voice. Help! I ran to the edge of the hill and I saw Jamie lying on the ground far below. Her leg was twisted to the side, obviously broken. What happened? I called to her. Very weakly, Jamie answered. Tanya pushed me. And then I felt two hands on my back. Tanya was right behind me, trying to push me over the edge like she'd done to Jamie. I stumbled forward but didn't fall. I was able to twist around and face her. We fought along the cliff. She kept scratching at me wildly. She got me backed up against the cliff. I had nowhere to go. Why are you doing this? I asked. She slept with my boyfriend, Tanya said. And I would have kept you out of this if you hadn't found us. 
Then she jerked forward, but instead of standing there, I dove to the side and she toppled over the edge. I heard a terrible splat as her body landed on something. I quickly grabbed my cell and called 911. Then I climbed down into the valley to be with Jamie. I passed by Tanya's body. She was definitely dead. As Jamie and I waited for help to arrive, Jamie struggled to stay awake. The pain and loss of blood was really getting to her. She asked me how I found her and I honestly didn't know what to say. The only reason I found her was because of that Ouija board. If I hadn't asked it that question, then poor Jamie would have died in the woods. I went to a small college in New Jersey. It was as far away from my hometown as possible, and that was exactly what I wanted. I expected to just get an apartment near campus, but the college said that it was mandatory for freshmen to stay in dorms. I asked if I could pay extra for a private dorm, but there weren't any available. So, I ended up in a tiny dorm with a roommate named Teresa. Back in high school, I was a very social person, but I ended up having a really bad falling out with all my friends and decided to just focus on myself for a while. Basically, I was one of the mean girls at school, and toward the end of senior year, I realized that I didn't like the kind of person I was becoming. So, when I found out that I had a roommate, I promised myself that no matter what, I would treat her with respect and dignity. Unfortunately, Teresa did not treat me with the same respect. She was absolutely awful. She'd steal my food and say these really passive aggressive insults to me, as if I was too stupid to know that she was being mean. It took all my strength not to argue with her, but I figured that if I kept treating her nicely, she'd eventually mellow out. That did not happen. One morning, I was about to brush my teeth when I noticed that there were little brown flakes on my toothbrush. I knew right away that Teresa had done something to it. She must have stuck it in the toilet. I felt disgusted. I almost threw up. Of course, when I told Teresa about it, she said that she didn't do anything. She even said that I needed to take better care of my teeth if that's what my toothbrush looked like. After that, I started to notice other little signs throughout the dorm that Teresa was messing with me. My milk tasted funny, as if she'd stuck some kind of chemical in it. My shoes were filled with ants because she hid breadcrumbs inside them. And when I took a shower, my scalp started to burn when I was using my shampoo. I had to rinse it off as quickly as possible because she'd replaced it with bleach or something. Every time I talked with her, I tried to be as nice as possible. I didn't directly accuse her of anything, even though I knew that she was the one making my life miserable. But whenever I said anything, no matter how gently I said it, she acted like I was insane, like I was making everything up. Honestly, it was driving me crazy. I even went to our RA to ask if I could change rooms, and she told me it wasn't possible until the next semester. I was stuck with her. Eventually, I just stopped talking to her completely. I'd answer questions if she asked me something, otherwise I just kept to myself. It was really hard because I didn't have any close friends at college yet. I was still trying to find my place. I didn't have anyone to listen to me vent my anger. It was terrible. And the worst thing about it was that I kept thinking about all the awful things I used to do to my less popular classmates back in high school. I mean, I was never as bad as Teresa, but I was still pretty mean. In a way, I kind of felt that karma was striking back at me or something. I ended up putting a lock on my door and keeping all my personal belongings and my food in my bedroom so that she couldn't mess with anything. It seemed to work because the pranks stopped happening, but that was no way to live. It felt like a prisoner in my own dorm. After about a week of doing this, I finally decided that enough was enough. I stopped hiding everything in my room and I installed a couple hidden cameras throughout the dorm so I could catch Teresa in the act. I didn't have to wait long. The first night that the cameras were out, I caught Teresa pouring something into my cereal. I couldn't tell what it was, but it must not have been good. That's when a dark idea crossed my mind. After Teresa went to bed, I poured out all the cereal into a bowl and added a bunch of other ingredients to make brownies. The next morning, I surprised Teresa with the whole tray of brownies and told her that it was a thank you gesture for being such a good roommate. She was suspicious at first, but I'm a pretty good actress, so she ended up taking a piece. Together, we sat at the table and I watched her eat the brownie while I drank some orange juice. Once she ate the whole piece, I finally confronted her about everything. 
I told her that I knew she'd been messing with me, and I was done putting up with her crap. I demanded that she tell me why she hated me so much, and for the first time since we moved in, she was honest with me. She looked me dead in the eyes and asked, You don't remember me at all, do you? When I didn't answer, she explained that she actually went to my high school. She was one of the kids I bullied, and she couldn't believe that I never recognized her. She'd been waiting months for me to finally realize that I knew her, but I never did. I couldn't believe it. She even pulled out her phone and showed me photos of her back in high school. Back then, her hair was different and she wore glasses, but otherwise, she looked pretty much the same. Do you remember me now? She asked. You made my life miserable back then. I felt terrible for the kind of person I used to be, but I couldn't just lie to her. I told her that I still didn't remember her at all. That was definitely the wrong thing to say, because she jumped out of her chair and dove forward like she was going to strangle me. But as she got closer, she started to choke. I figured I needed to come clean about the brownies. I told her that I knew she was putting something in my cereal, so I poured it all into the brownies that she just ate. Her eyes got really wide, and she kept choking. What did you put in my cereal? I asked. Rat. Poison. She choked out. Of course, I called 911 right away. She was taken directly to the hospital. It's been two weeks and she's still recovering there. I should probably go over and visit, but I doubt that she wants to see me. The best part is that, for now, I have the dorm all to myself. It was my first time camping out in the woods. I'd been to a couple of those big camping and glamping sites before, which were usually equipped with facilities and had staff on hand for emergencies. But this time, we would be out in the boonies. Just us, and our tents, and the natural wilderness. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous about the trip. I wasn't the biggest fan of the outdoors. And the thought of having no access to hot water, or public conveniences, or any of my usual home comforts wasn't the most appealing. But my brother really wanted to go and I was the one he had asked. I'd always found it difficult to say no to my brother. He was younger than me by a couple of years, and I had a soft spot for his puppy eyes, so of course I had agreed. We went on a weekday, since we both had the day off work, and it meant that the roads were quieter for travel. We packed everything up into the trunk of my car and made the two-hour trip to the forest where we had decided to set up camp. Are you nervous? I asked as we pulled into the small gravel car park at the edge of the trees. Eh, not really, Jake said with that casual shrug of his. Why, are you? I bit my lip. I didn't want to seem like an uncool older brother, but I didn't want to lie to him either about my reservations. A little. I've never gone camping out in the wild before, I said. Jake rolled his eyes. I would hardly call it the wild, he said, unclipping his seatbelt and pushing the door open. We'll be fine. We have radios and plenty of emergency supplies. I nodded, stepping out onto the gravel and taking a deep breath of the fresh pine-scented air. <sighs> You're right. I'm sure it'll be fine. We hauled our gear out of the trunk, two heavy backpacks and a shoulder bag, and I locked the car behind me before we set off into the forest. It was immediately darker beneath the trees, despite it still being a little before midday. The air was humid, and I swatted bugs and twigs out of my face with a disgruntled sigh. <laughs> You're going to have to get used to the bugs, Jake said with a chuckle. I brought bug spray if you get desperate. You could have told me that before we started walking. Jake only grinned, showing no remorse whatsoever. There were places in the forest that were marked as appropriate campsites and Jake had chosen one in an open clearing close to a river. I could hear it trickling through the undergrowth when we reached the site and started setting up. It took us just under an hour to get the tent set up and unpack all of our supplies. By the time we had finished, I had worked up a sweat, and my forehead was slick with perspiration. I wiped it away and took a long swig from my flask of water. Now that that's out of the way, I'm going to explore, Jake said looking as though he was about to rush off through the trees. Hey, 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 not so fast, I said, grabbing him by his elbow. We're not separating for a moment that we're out here. He pouted. <sighs> Seriously? Even when I need to take a leak? 
I rolled my eyes. You're my baby bro. I'm not letting anything happen to you while we're here. He shrugged me off. I'm not a baby anymore, Alex, he said gruffly. Fine, let's go together. You'll remember how to find the campsite? Jake nodded, taking out his compass. Out here in the forest, with limited signal, we had to go old school with our equipment. No fancy GPS out here. All right then, let's go. When we come back, I'll get started on dinner. We left the campsite in the clearing and headed deeper into the forest, following a northeast trajectory according to Jake's compass. The further we went, the thicker the trees became, pressing close together to create a dense, almost impassable thicket. A clump of sharp twigs snagged me back and tore a hole through the material of my shirt. I cursed out loud, trying to untangle the branches from my clothes. I finally pulled free and glanced up. Jake was gone. Panic burned through my chest like a raging fire, and I scanned the trees ahead of me for any sign of my brother. Jake? Jake, where did you go? When he didn't answer me, my panic doubled, and I dashed forward through the trees, not caring when branches scratched and tore at my skin. Jake! This was exactly what I had been afraid of. The forest was large, and it was far too easy to get lost. The more I thrashed and stumbled through the trees, the more disoriented I grew, the sky barely visible through the canopy, giving me no clue as to which direction I was headed. It was starting to get dark as well. The shadows were growing thicker around me, making it harder to see. Jake! Where- My voice died in my throat when I glimpsed a figure standing behind the trees ahead of me. Only part of their silhouette was visible, like an ink blot on a canvas. Jake. Hey, Jake. I stumbled forward, reaching out to him, when something stopped me. A hand on my shoulder. I almost screamed, spinning round. Jake was standing behind me, a concerned look on his face. Whoa, Alex, I'm right here. What's wrong? My heart thundered in my chest as I caught my breath. <sighs> oh, I thought I'd lost you, I said, my voice still a little shaky. Then I frowned. If Jake was here, then who had I seen standing behind the trees just now? With a start, I turned to where I'd seen the shadow. The trees were empty. There was nobody there. Had I simply imagined it? Alex, is something wrong? I swallowed hard, shaking my head. No, nothing's wrong. It's starting to get dark now. We should head back to the campsite. Jake nodded. I cast one last glance at the trees behind me before following him. I was relieved when we reached the campsite again and immediately got to work starting a small fire. Now the smoke and flames would at least keep some of the bugs away. As we ate dinner around the fire, I couldn't help but think about the strange shadow I had seen standing between the trees. The more I thought about it, the less likely it seemed that I had merely imagined it. Did that mean we weren't alone out here? It wasn't weird for other hikers or campers to be out, but why hadn't they said anything? Are you sure you're okay, Alex? You've been distracted since we got out. I didn't want to scare my brother, so I decided not to tell him what I'd seen. Yeah, just a little tired. Yeah, me too, he said, stretching out his arms. Once the fire dies out, I think I'm going to head to sleep. Jake retired first, heading into the tent after bidding me good night. Despite my trepidation, I stayed out a little longer, listening to the birds and bugs scuttling through the undergrowth. I was about to follow my brother when, in the dying light of the fire, I thought I glimpsed something moving through the trees on my left. I hastily scrambled for my flashlight and clicked it on, directing the beam into the darkness. Nothing. Maybe I was being paranoid, but the strange chill on my neck told me that maybe I wasn't. Maybe there really was someone out there. I waited for another ten minutes, shining my light through the trees until the fire died out completely and it was time for me to get some sleep. I ducked into the tent I was sharing with Jake and zipped it closed. After a moment, I decided to tie the zipper to the strap of one of our packs, so that if anyone tried to open it from the outside, it would be more difficult, and make more noise. 
Then I crawled into my sleeping bag beside my snoring brother and fell asleep. I awoke the next morning, to Jake violently shaking my shoulder. I gave a start, blinking the grogginess out of my eyes as I asked him what was wrong. You need to come and see this, he gasped, fear twisting his face. The panic in his voice was enough to sober me up, and I scrambled after him out of the tent into the clearing. Sprawled out, right in the middle of our campsite, where the cold remains of the fire lay, was a dead crow. It had been badly mutilated, its wings torn and its body slashed open. Blood soaked the ground around it. And someone had smeared blood on the outside of our tent, too, in swaths of long fingerprints that almost looked too big to be human. Oh my god, I whispered, my mind going back to the shadowy figure I had seen standing between the trees. We hadn't been alone last night, after all. I turned to Jake, my mouth going dry. I think it's time we get out of here, I said. This time, Jake didn't argue. The other day, my boyfriend Tim complained that whenever we went out to eat, I was the one who always chose the restaurant. I didn't realize I did that, but I guess he was right. So I told him that the next time we go out for dinner, we could go wherever he wanted to go. And do you know where he took me? Hooters. The one restaurant I never expected myself to eat at. Honestly, when he said it, I thought he was joking. But no, he was dead serious. And since I'd already agreed, I couldn't say no. So that Saturday, I came back from my afternoon yoga class and Tim drove us to Hooters. The whole drive there, he talked about how excited he was. He'd always wanted to go. He assured me that the food was good. Whatever. I just wanted to get it over with. When we got there, it didn't seem too bad. There wasn't any line, and the building seemed pretty nice. But when we got inside and asked for a table for two, Tim looked around the place and his whole expression changed. Um, I've changed my mind, he said. Let's go somewhere else. No, I told him. We're already here. It's okay, he said. I know you didn't really want to come here. I don't know what caused him to do a total 180, but it didn't matter. We were here, I was hungry, and we were going to eat. The voluptuous hostess took us back to a table near the bar and we sat down. Tim kept looking around, visibly nervous. I asked him if anything was wrong, and once again he said that we should go somewhere else. We didn't. We waited there for a couple of minutes until a blonde waitress came up to ask for our drink orders. She seemed friendly, but she barely even looked at me. She focused all her attention on Tim. I assumed that was what the waitresses at Hooters were trained to do. They gave all their attention to the male customers, and they probably got better tips that way. We ordered, and the waitress left. It didn't take long for our drinks to arrive. The waitress gave me my margarita, but when she was handing Tim his beer, she accidentally dropped the bottle right on his lap. His pants were soaked. She kept apologizing and he just said, it's okay, it's okay, over and over again. The waitress suggested that Tim go to the bathroom to dry off. They had air dryers in there. Tim thanked her and said he was fine. Just go, I told him. You can't sit here in wet clothes. He tried to think of an excuse, but when he couldn't think of anything, he got up and left. As he was going, he told the waitress to get him another beer. She said that she would, but he wouldn't leave until she walked back to the bar. Obviously, Tim was acting really weird. I had no idea why, but once he was gone, I found out. The waitress hurried back to the table and told me that she'd spilled his beer on purpose. She wanted to talk to me, alone. What's going on? I asked. Your boyfriend and I have been sleeping together for months now, she explained. I'm so sorry. He always said he was single, but I never really believed it. I wasn't going to say anything, but you seem so nice, so I just had to tell you. She was going to say something else, something important, but she saw Tim exit the bathroom and she scurried off. Now, everything made sense. Why he acted so nervous, why he wanted to leave the restaurant as soon as we got here. Tim sat down and asked, Did the waitress come back while you were gone? Not yet. 
I lied. I think she's still getting your beer. She seems nice, so I hope you're okay if we tip her a lot, even though she spilled on you. He looked at me suspiciously. Yeah, he said. That should be fine. The rest of our dinner went pretty smoothly. We got our food, which was delicious by the way, and the waitress treated us like any other customers. Tim was on edge the whole time, but I just pretended like absolutely nothing was wrong. When the bill came, the waitress gave the tray to me. I could tell from her expression that she wanted me to have it. Tim tried to reach for the bill, but I swatted his hand away. You're such an amazing boyfriend, I told him. You always treat me so well, and since the restaurant was your choice, I like to treat you. He didn't argue. I looked over the bill, which wasn't too expensive, and then noticed that she'd written something on the back of the customer's copy. Tim was staring at me, so I shoved the customer's copy in my pocket to read it later. As I promised, I gave the woman a very big tip. It wasn't her fault that my boyfriend was a cheating scumbag. As we drove back home, Tim seemed relieved. He was proud of himself for getting through the dinner without being caught. He had no idea that I knew everything. When we got back home, I went to the bathroom to finally read the hidden message on our receipt. It just looked like a bunch of letters and numbers, but I eventually figured out that it was the URL address to some website. I pulled out my phone and typed in the address. I couldn't believe it. It was a address where Tim dressed in different animal costumes and performed all kinds of explicit acts on a bunch of different people, not just the waitress. He was selling these videos and he didn't go by his own name. He called himself the Stallion. Horrified, I silently left the bathroom, gathered up my stuff, and walked out of the house without saying a word. Tim tried to call me a bunch of times after that, but I didn't answer. I had no idea that one trip to Hooters would make me realize what a disgusting, cheating sleazebag my boyfriend was. The weather was cold at that time of year type of winter that came with a dry mist stung the eyes and rasped in the lungs when one breathed. The snow was knee-deep, with the promise of more snowfall as the hours progressed. I recall the sensations I felt waddling through the puddle of snow towards the cabin. The alcohol in my belly had begun to alter my sensitivity, and I felt thrilled by cheap jokes Martin threw. All three of us heading towards that haunted cabin, far removed from the university campus, should have been all the red flags we should have needed to dissuade us from such a trip. We were boys, and it seemed to be that our own curiosity and its allure had such a hold on us already. Careful, Michael, Greg, the third party in our trio, said to me as I climbed up the steps that led into the dilapidated cabin. Oh, shit. I whimpered, collapsing with my hands held out to stop my fall. The ruins of the building shook violently. I felt all of the centuries of the building standing on its own since the university was established. The humble construction of wood and ingenuity was a testament of our university's prestige and endurance. But half a century ago, the rumors of the cabin home being haunted began to spread. The words changed perception quickly. I gasped as I picked myself up. That was fine, I told the boys, and we could start recording our experience. There was hardly any way to know what to expect when we stepped into the airy building because the air outside and that inside had the same temperature. Whatever smell we may have received of blood or rotten flesh was masked by the cold. Three university students armed with an Ouija board and a camera phone to pick up any strange incidents we found in the rooms. Shut the door, Martin said to me as I walked in. I turned around and the frigid air whistled ominously through the porch. I hesitated for a small moment, took a deep breath, and pushed the door shut. The hollow lodging fell black. Greg's camera light came on. I gulped in an attempt to swallow the uneasy feeling that crept up my stomach. The general atmosphere was stained with an awry mood. And even though I was still unafraid, I could not help but notice it. Are you ready? Martin asked as he produced the Ouija board, placing it on the floor before us. I nodded in the darkness. I suspect Greg did the same as his camera light dropped on the Ouija board. 
Martin cleared his throat and placed his fingers on the board, snagging the pendulum that swung this way and that for answers. The frigid air made my heartbeat spike, but it was normal, I assured myself. I did the same with him, and Greg's hands joined ours. Martin had the first question of the evening. He asked if there were only three of us in the lodge after some consideration. The pendulum shifted across the letters. I could not tell what it was that triggered our muscles that way, but it felt surreal that I was so compelled to push the pendulum towards the Y and the E before settling on the S. My brows caved in suspicion. It was not the assurance that I wished for. I did not believe in the power of such a simple board game to speak truth or connect our natural plane to one of utter terror. Is my name Josh? Martin asked. Our fingers moved the pendulum, and it dragged from the S letter to an N, then to the O. A raspy phlegm blocked my airways, and I blinked instinctively. We all sensed that the Ouija board was working just as we wanted it to, yet it was strange that we could not rationalize how it worked and the science behind it. Martin wasted no time. Is this cabin lodge haunted? Martin asked. I blinked again. It felt like an eternity since before the pendulum we had our fingers on began to move. I watched in utter horror as it glided across the board towards the Y. My respiration turned shallow. The alcohol I had drunk before our silly adventure wore off my eyes and I could feel the wind of something sinister drift closer to us. My fingers began to quiver and my uneasy stomach rumbled. The pendulum shifted to the side of the letter E and stopped. My ears whirred. I wanted out. It was a game taken too far. Yo! I hollered. The pendulum had stopped at the S. Martin had a smirk on his face. The angle of the camera and the light cast his aspect in such a dreadful manner that horrified me. I wondered how he could manage to be so calm. I turned to Greg, and his eyes had a red glint from staring directly at the light. He was not laughing. He was expressionless. Are we being haunted right now? Martin asked, and my attention shifted from Greg for a second. The silence around the room deepened. Y. E. S. The bang so loud it tore through my numb senses, shaking the entire house. I was in disbelief at how swift the figure swept through the darkness. The bulk seemed heavy because its feet slamming on the floor carried so much force. Martin burst out in a shriek. What the hell? He blurted. I felt something warm spritz on my face. The metallic smell and the gargling bellow of Martin in pain sent my senses into overdrive. Greg lifted his camera to Martin's face. My knees buckled at the sight of blood dripping down the side of his neck, straight into the waiting mouth of a fat, bald man. The frenzy of my beating heart ceased, and all that was life in my head flashed right through my eyes. Greg hollered, and this grunting man turned on Greg, knocking the camera out of his hands. The room dropped into bleak darkness, and the camera bounced to the corner of the room. Jesus Christ! I cried, spinning around blindly to escape this unknown being that had begun to squeeze Greg's hand and drink out of it. My heart thumped on my ribcage in desperation for escape, even as my feet sought the same. I found the door first and pulled it open forcefully could not have welcomed daylight as gray as the day was in my entire life as I did in that moment. Shit, I heard someone say, brushing immediately past me as I stepped out. What followed was a ripping batch of gunshot that caused a loud crash. I turned around, and a guard with denim pants and a checkered shirt was staring back at me with a gun in his hand. His gaze was curious, and his mouth hung in studied silence before he spoke. Did it get you? He asked. I was too shaken to have an answer for him. He did not persist. 
20 years of haunting this cabin, and it takes you idiots to lure him out of his hiding in daylight. He kissed his teeth and looked down on the riddled body of the man. It all happened so quickly that it was at that moment it dawned on me that I had just been saved. Greg, Martin, I mewled. Emergency services will be here in ten minutes. I called them when I saw you morons come in, the guard mentioned. The cold winter air running into my nostrils did not feel so cold anymore. It warmed me with relief. His ruffling pants exposed his presence when he walked up beside me. It was the sound of sleeky iron fabric, the type that was distinguishable by the way it sounded. I looked away from my Big Mac, my eyes falling to his shoes first. The polished pair was impressive, and they glistened as though they had been dipped in a bowl of oil. I trailed up his ankle and the straight cut of his pants, so pristinely ironed I had the sense that the creases would slice open one's hands if they inadvertently ran their finger along the line. I took a deep breath, and this man, as though perceiving my attention was on him, drew his suit tighter on his body to flex the contour of his pants and how well it sat on him. My stomach tugged with envy for his style. He headed straight to the table with two empty seats away from me and sat opposite to the man who was dining on fries and a large cup of soda. I noticed the man reacted instinctively at first. He flinched and drew his hands away from the table. The man in the suit, however, continued to speak. Words I could not tell because his lips moved fast. A moment passed and the other man warmed up to the stranger. The stranger offered a handshake and the dining man took it. It was a strange thing to witness in a McDonald's, but I had enough food and a little entertainment, so I was curious enough to watch the exchange continue. The stranger exposed a suitcase and the other man's burger fell from his hands. I felt an indescribable feeling when his eyes lit up. My curiosity peaked, and it was with utmost restraint that I remained seated. The stranger pulled out a board, and just as suddenly, a voice broke out from the counter. Hey, this is a McDonald's establishment, not a kid's park. We don't allow any of that here. The attendant, a red-haired woman, wrinkled and bespectacled, called out. The stranger did not move, and I struggled to maintain my attention on the McDonald's counter, and the man who sat on the table with the stranger. The atmosphere turned tense, but there was a stillness around the stranger that made the hair on my forearm stand on edge. The cozy smell of buns did not seem to have its effect once this new air blew into the establishment. It was dusk, and there were four of us, complete strangers to each other. Yet this strange man in a suit who I had just found fascinating seemed even stranger. The man opposite him stole glances at me. The furtive look of confusion as the McDonald's attendant started to rail at the defiance. The stranger did not slacken his character until he made the sudden announcement. I win. You lose. His tone was flat. He stood up to his feet and pulled his arms apart. The man opposite the table kept his eyes on the open suitcase just as I did. He looked straight at me and I saw the interest in his eyes. My mouth was dry even though I had food and drinks in front of me. I sensed it was my nerves fraying, but it was so terrible, even the taste on my tongue was altered to a coarse tingle. It was like a moment in a dream. I struggled to reconcile the look of betrayal in his eyes when he saw that he did not fully comprehend what he was proposing. I will collect now, the stranger said, calling both our attention to the fact that he was now standing behind the man. He reached his hands around the man's neck and pulled back what I suspected to be a string. The man's eyes widened in horror, but his scream was cut off before he could utter it. The man's neck simply wobbled, like jelly when the instrument passed into his neck. The skin of his neck remained, but the matter that held his head to his body suddenly appeared to have dissolved. The attendant let out a loud shriek of horror when the stranger shoved the man's head onto the table. The cry rocked my bones with its beastly chill. It was so deep and piercing that it gave depth to the horror I had just been assaulted with. Who wants to play my game next? There are two of you. The man said with an assuredness that made me freeze in fear. His eyes were gauzy, yet pale. His hands were white, 
almost drained of blood. And when I stared at it long, I soon started to notice the vein strip network etched around the back. I hoped for the floor to open up as an escape from me and the monster in front of me. I could not trust the attendant to not act rationally under panic, and it made me nervous. You will pay, he said, and my stomach immediately sank. I shook my head and my fuzzy mind cleared up to observe that he had not pointed at me, but at the attendant behind the counter. She shrieked, hands on her face which had become red from trauma, and made an attempt to escape from him. He glided across the McDonald's in a steady, unwavering momentum. He did not run, and his march was so hypnotizing, he was almost onto her when I finally snapped out of the transfixation. I'm calling the cops, I barked, shaking terribly and with no idea where I had dropped my phone. He paid me no mind. Sheer dread made my ears click. He was smiling, and I could sense his grin from where he was. You will play the game, win or lose, he said to her, and she scrambled around to fetch a knife, but it did nothing to stop his advances at her. Still, she swung her hands to aim at him. I looked back at the body of the man who had just been murdered, and I struggled to make sense of my night at the McDonald's, which had started off with two large orders of fries, one soda, and two burgers. Stay away, she cried, and her tone was so desperate and so broken, it spurred me into action without thought. I threw myself across the room and towards the counter. She aimed the knife at me, but I was fueled by such a dizzying rush that I snatched the knife from her before I realized I had. You sick moron! I bawled as I lunged at him, whipping the knife into his neck and twisting it all the way back until it stopped by his shoulder bone. He did not resist me and it frightened me so much that I recoiled without the knife after I had dug it in. He stopped and scoffed, gasping for breath after a moment as the color of his suit changed to mark the spread of his blood. He fell to his knees with a smile on his face, dying. You didn't get to play. He mentioned, falling face first into the ground, dead. Oh my god! The McDonald's attendant cried when she finally regained her senses. Call the cops! I had just ended a strange man's life, and the horror he had visited upon strangers. I did not have the stomach for questions. I stared at her and jumped over the counter to escape the senseless barbarity I had just experienced.